three hours of the very best entitled parent stories from the past couple of months. Sit back, relax, and let's get straight into this. My mother thinks she's entitled to one of my properties. I haven't seen my mother since I was 16 when we were in court. So that's 19 years that I haven't had any contact with her. She hired a PI to find me and I still refuse to talk to her. I even had my lawyer send her a formal letter of no contact and threatened her with a restraining order. She sent this email to me through my work email. I've shortened it, but it basically said, to my name, this is your mother. I thought you would have matured by now and come and apologize to me and your father for what you put us through. Because of you, your father lost his teaching career and we had to sell our house. However, it has come to my knowledge that you own some properties in the area. So it's only right if you give us one of them as an apology. This property, one of my most expensive properties, would be a good fit for us. As soon as you hand over the keys to the property, we'll finally be able to start to heal and get past this misunderstanding that you blew out of proportion. I hope you come to the right decision. Signed, her name. I just can't stop laughing at this. Like, no, I'm not giving you anything. This is just another bit of evidence to help me get a restraining order against her. 19 years of no contact with your own mother and she comes back into your life to request one of your houses. Wow, that is the definition of entitled. My mum, the internet sleuth. I am a 39 year old woman and I've always had a difficult relationship with my parents. I've had periods of no contact with them. In 2019, my mum ended up in ICU and almost died. She's had major medical issues since then and will continue to have them. I've been doing my best to be a part of their life since 2019. We live within driving distance, but it's a couple of hours away. Mostly I email my dad and talk to my mum on the phone once a week. About two weeks ago, my mum got upset with me for not giving her more details about my family's activities. I was driving and talking to her and she started asking for details about a 50k my husband was running here's the thing i honestly didn't have the details yes i knew the race was coming up but he and i made plans to sit down and discuss the details after his packet pickup he's active duty in the military and he works long hours we have two teen girls i love my husband and kids so much and do everything i can to keep the household running smoothly and keep track of everything but i have health issues and i do my best but i can only handle so much at once Hence the, give me the 50k details when I need them. Until then, good luck with your training. Anyway, my mum felt that I lied to her about not knowing the 50k details. She went online and looked up the race and threw it in my face that she could find the information. And what kind of a wife doesn't know what race her husband is running in? She wanted me to know she could figure out what the race was, where it was, look at the course maps, etc. Even though she had no intention of being at the race to cheer him on. She does this kind of stuff a lot. She uses the internet to get information if she feels like I'm not giving her all the information she wants she'll look up the kids school calendars search for information on any company i work for research the kids schools etc she'll do it because she says she wants information to make conversation and that she feels irrelevant in her life i told her i was uncomfortable with the internet searches and intrusion and asked her to stop i told her if she wants to make conversation then she should just talk to us and respect us if there are things people don't want to share she says there's nothing wrong with what she's doing she and my dad say that anything they do is out of love and to view it negatively is unfair to them she got mad at me and had my dad email me without ever talking to me about my side of the story he sends me an email saying i'm ungrateful for all she did as a mum and that i lied to her for no reason after i called my sister hysterically crying about how i can't take the drama and blaming anymore my mum is now saying that i didn't lie but that my dad did nothing wrong she says i need to stop right fighting with them for an apology the whole thing is exhausting and it's a repeated pattern with them i've asked them for time and space to get over this They say that my mum is going to die someday and is in poor health. And I'm a jerk for not just moving on. Look, I get it. On the one hand, obviously your mum wants to know more about what's going on in your life. But there's a way to do that, right? And it's definitely not by searching online and being just like some weird online predator getting information that you yourself don't even have about your family and also if you're gonna get that information and then just accuse your daughter of lying what's the point in that conversation anyway like who's gonna get any enjoyment out of that i think the weird thing is is that your parents seem to think that you owe them all the information that you have about your entire family that's not really how it works like you get to choose what you share surely i reckon in future don't tell her anything anymore just say if you want to know look it up on the internet simple as that entitled child destroys my property and threatens to evict me with their entitled mother for context my childhood 
was spent growing up in Dubai in a villa compound, which is basically like a mini gated community of 16 odd villa homes that each have a private back garden that then converges in a large shared space with a pool, social area, foliage, etc. Now, as a result of this, everyone got to know their neighbors very well due to the shared social space. And as most homes had kids, we'd all play together in the pool. Now, there was a particular family with two very entitled children who we shall call Anna and Francis, who must have been about nine. These little turds were well known for causing trouble in the community and generally being extremely entitled. One story that sticks out to me is the following, which I hope you enjoy. One afternoon, my younger brother runs into our house, having been playing in a group with some other kids and Anna and Francis, very frustrated. He announces to me that Anna and Francis are currently in our private back garden, ripping the heads off of our flowers. I of course go outside to find the two gremlins, ripping apart plants and kicking our hedges in whilst being supervised by their nanny, who spoke very little English. What do you think you're doing? I say. Anna replies, F you, we can do what we want. Stop that and get out of our garden. The nanny just stood there with a vacant expression on her face. So I walk up to her as the kids continue to destroy our garden. Excuse me, aren't you going to do something? No, they do what they want till dinner. This is our garden. Can you make them leave, please? This time, no response besides vacant blinking. So naturally, my younger brother and I turn to the gremlins and very firmly tell them, stop and get out now and start to usher them towards the exits. This is when Anna drops some big threats. My mother owns this whole compound. We own your house, you butthole. They had colorful language for children their age. She really doesn't. Now get out. We own your house. We can break anything we want. We can do anything we want. We'll get you kicked out. At this point, we've pushed them out, followed meekly by their nanny, and locked the garden gates. On the other side, they hurl obscenities and eventually run off to find their entitled mother. I'm told by my own mum that she had a heated conversation with their entitled mum, who in fact did not own the compound, nor our house, but was very displeased that her children's fun was interrupted by my brother and I. Apparently, we have no right to upset or interfere in matters involving my children, and we would do well to keep your business to yourselves or the landlord will be called. Suffice to say, my mum was not having any of it and asked politely that her children don't invite themselves into our garden and don't destroy our property, which was, in fact, grounds to involve the landlord. The woman left in a huff and we didn't hear from them for a couple of weeks, thankfully, but it wouldn't be long before we cross paths with their BS again. Now, thankfully, OP has posted some more stories about this entitled family and the rest of today's episode will be made up of not one, not two, but three more posts just made in the past couple of days all about these guys let's get right into the next one entitled child and entitled mother demand birthday presents and the entitled mum thinks she's a queen this series is now being called tales from the compound a few weeks passed since our last unpleasant brush with this family so we were perhaps a little taken aback to discover a birthday party invitation on our front door one summer morning it was graciously inviting my sister and my brother to francis's 10th birthday to be held in his back garden and in the compound shared social space suffice to say my siblings would have sooner taken an hour-long nap at the bottom of the swimming pool than accept this invitation so the big day rolls around and from our back porch we can see that a massive inflatable bouncy castle was now uncomfortably nestled in in the social area between the trees. Bunting and confetti littered the pool area, and no less than 60 children were running wild, screaming with delight. But then a particularly peculiar sight presented itself a true spectacle. The spectacle in question was the entitled mother dressed in an extravagant gown on the upper balcony of her house, calling the children forth to then begin to shower them with sweets and candy, like a Mardi Gras queen throwing beads to the public atop a parade float. The children all cheer as bowl after bowl of candy is thrown from above, and by this point, my family and I have seen enough and go inside. The cheers and screams seemed to die down by around five that evening. It was clear the party was drawing to a close. So you can imagine my surprise to be disturbed from my Yogscast Tech at Minecraft video by Francis's egregious knocking on my back door. Can I help you? I don't want to talk to you. Where are your siblings? They're busy right now. How was your birthday party? Well, get me my presents then. Your presents? Yes, the one from your brother and the one from your sister. He begins to try and step into my doorway to find his presents, but I stop him. They haven't got you anything as they didn't go to your party. They were invited, therefore I want my freaking presents. Francis screams for his nanny at the top of his lungs, who quickly appears with arms full of his previous gifts. Bring me their presents and then put all of these in my room. She meekly nods and attempts to walk through my doorway too. I once again have to stop her. She doesn't say anything in response to this and simply awkwardly stands there. At this point, I shut the door and wish him a happy birthday, assuming this would be the end of the matter. The next day, my siblings and I were enjoying the swimming pool when the looming shadow of this gremlin interrupted us once again. You owe me presents. 
We didn't come to your party. Francis then says to my siblings, I'm going to need my birthday presents and an apology present from each of you. I genuinely couldn't help but laugh at the ridiculousness of this, and it seemed to enrage him further, considering the seriousness written across his face. So, of course, it's time to get the queen herself involved, the entitled mother. After rushing off in a huff, Francis returns with her, and she seems even less happy to see us than we are to see her. What have you all done to upset my child this time? He's demanding gifts from us that we don't have. Well, why not? Because we don't. It's his birthday. I'm aware. She starts to speak slower and more enunciated as if I'm the slow one and not quite getting the obvious. On a birthday, you give presents. Yeah, we understand how birthdays work. Good. Then you should understand why my baby is upset. She proceeded to stand there with her hands on her hips expectingly, as if we were meant to get out of the pool and present her son with gifts that second. We of course did no such thing and continued with our swimming lesson, leaving her there on the edge of the pool, red-faced and irked. I'll tell you what, wouldn't it be great if that was how it worked? Even if you just got an invite to someone's birthday party and you didn't go, you couldn't go, you didn't even know them, you said let's get them a present. Because wow, the amount of invites I'd send, I would be doing very well for myself. But there we go, that is part two in the Tales from the Compound series. Let's move straight in to part three. Entitled child punches my head, shoots paintballs into my property, whilst the entitled father tells me off and revs his Ferrari at 5 a.m. So today, I'm not going to be talking about Anna, Francis, and their entitled mother. Instead, it's time to talk about another family, my next door neighbors, and more specifically, an entitled father and his 10 year old son, who we'll call Simon. I honestly chose to interact with my neighbors as little as possible. So this post is more of a collection of mini stories of them that I've compiled to paint you guys a full picture of their entitledness. I grew up next to a mosque, and some might find the muezzin singing a call to prayer every morning and every night through a loudspeaker to be bothersome or disturbing to their sleep pattern. I, however, quite enjoyed listening to her. But what I didn't enjoy listening to was my neighbor, the entitled father, revving his black Ferrari's engine first thing in the morning and last thing before night. This entitled father rarely drove his gorgeous black Ferrari, but in order to keep the engine turning over and stop sand settling in it, every day and night, without fail, he'd rev the engine as loud as he could for 10 minutes with a fat cigar hanging from his mouth. He'd also have a very young, assumably very poor teenager cycle over every single evening and clean the car from top to bottom over the course of an hour, even when he was away on business. He'd also have his maids and nannies set up his entire back garden social area with pillows, candles, trays of cigars and flowers before it was even light outside, and we quite literally never saw him use it. But one person we did see use that back garden was Simon. Simon had a paintball gun, and Simon loved to fire off rounds into other people's property. And he loved to make his nannies clean up the paintball mess in his own garden as he cackled maniacally. But the paintballs aren't the worst memory I have of Simon. On his ninth birthday, Simon had a WWE party to which I was invited. And this kid was truly a fanatic. His bouncy castle was WWE themed, the decorations and cake all depicted John Cena and The Undertaker, and his WWE toys littered his garden. About 40 kids were in attendance. The parents smoked and drank whilst the nannies and maids catered for the children. I only popped round for cake as my own parents suggested it would be polite. And they knew I'd rather smell what The Rock's cooking than spend longer than 10 minutes with Simon. I sort of got my wish because no sooner than I'd arrived, I was invited to enter the bouncy house for a WWE wrestling match with the birthday boy. He'd beaten every other boy at this party and was keen for a new challenger. And since I was a year older than him, he was certain my defeat would win him the belts. So I entered the ring, hoping there'd be some cake for me at the end of it. This was when I discovered that Simon had no idea what wrestling was as he ran at me and began to punch my head with the ferocity of a feral raccoon. Punch after punch, kick after kick connected with my head and groin for all of five seconds before I pushed him off and he stumbled back and tripped over his own feet on the uneven bouncy surface. This resulted in him bashing his glasses and face on the floor and into his nose and eye area where it looked like it was bruising. Of course, he burst into tears and ran to his entitled father, who he told that I'd punched him in the face and tried to kick in his glasses while he was down when he was simply bouncing on the bouncy castle. I was rightfully so berated by the entitled father for my violent tendencies and the fact that I'd ruined his son's birthday and possibly his face and that I should leave at once without cake. Considering my own parents weren't present, I didn't know any of the kids there and I'd been at the party for maybe two minutes tops, I saw no point in debating and welcomed the opportunity to return to my home for some Minecraft. Well, maybe the most violent post of the Tales from the Compound series so far. Um, yeah, that's not wrestling, my friend. That's just a brutal attack. Now, guys, you might be thinking, okay, is all of this 100% legit? You've got to remember that this is happening in Dubai. Now, look, I don't want to use any stigmas here or anything, but Dubai and the UAE is full of extreme 
extremely wealthy people and obviously their children are gonna be most of the time well not most of the time but likely you know very very spoiled and very well off and with that context noted you can really see how people like francis exist right and now for the final part in the tales from the compound series so far entitled child trespasses demands dinner and attempts to steal ours so one evening my family and i were enjoying a peaceful dinner on the back porch when we heard the sound of our garden gates lock being opened we could make out the silhouette of one francis speed walking up to the back of our house followed slowly by the nanny he sped up to our table before we had the chance to say anything and inquires what are you eating my parents were somewhat in shock and considering there were a couple of wine glasses down found his sudden presence quite amusing we're just having a roast francis said my dad how are you i'm hungry well your nanny is over there what would you like her to make you francis eyes the plate of pork sausages beside our roast chicken i want sausages Francis goes to greedily snatch our play, but my dad blocks him and luckily says, Francis, these are pork sausages. Francis was a Muslim, as such was not able to have pork on religious grounds. Francis takes a moment to process this information before quickly adding, beef sausages then, staring at us expectantly as if he were to go fetch him some, even going as far as to wave his hand at us after an awkward silent few seconds. I'm sorry, Francis, we don't have beef sausages. Well, snap. And just like that, like a spectre in the night, he disappeared as quickly as he appeared. Back into the night, trailed by his nanny. So there we go. That is the end of the Tales from the Compound series so far. Who knows? There might be more coming up. And if there is, don't you worry. It will be in your inboxes and your sub feeds and whatever, you know, you want to call them immediately. Trust me, I'm on them. Really enjoyed these four stories. Um, The first one was great. The last four, phenomenal. It's pretty amazing. I kind of do want to go back to the UAE to meet people like this and just see what they're really like. So I did go to Qatar before, but I didn't really interact with young entitled children. And that's what I love doing. Can that stay in? Yeah. Entitled mum upset that her boyfriend who tried to kill me isn't invited to Christmas brunch. A little backstory. My mum has always put her love interests and relationships before her children. I am a 27 year old woman and I have one older sister who is 30. Our entitled mum has been this way since I can remember. She has uprooted us from home to move to a new city for a man she loved who was married, made me stay the night at boyfriend's houses that I wasn't comfortable at and went as far as ditching my sister and I in a foreign country in a hostel while she went off with a man she just just met for a one night stand. She also slept with a guy I was seeing when I was around 17, 18. Luckily he was of legal age. You get the picture. The thing is, she's also incredibly intelligent, professional, and built an amazing career for herself in academia, and has and can be very supportive and loving of both my sister and me. She's given us both so many opportunities in life as a single mother, so it feels terrible to even point out these issues I have with her. Cut to 2019. I'm now married with a wonderful husband. My sister has a long-term partner. Our entitled mum has been dating this young man. They both live overseas where she's currently working. She's told us of their turbulent relationship, and as always, we watch as she shapeshifts to fit the type of woman she thinks he'll like. Like clockwork, we see her uproot her life, schedules everything to pursue this unhealthy relationship. She slowly but surely cuts us out of her life. It must be said that she has been physically, emotionally, and verbally abusive throughout my life, and this behavior has continued towards her partner. He also is abusive towards her. My sister and I have gone through the motions and tried to get her help, but she doesn't believe in mental illness, nor does she listen to anything we have to say. Our whole lives are spent trying to keep her stable, but now that we have our own lives for our own mental stability, we've just left it to her. That's been a whole thing in itself. Cut to the pressing issue. Two years ago, her boyfriend tried and threatened to kill myself, husband, my sister, her partner, and my mum in a drunken rage in the country they lived in at the time. He was charged with five counts of attempted murder, most traumatic moment of my life. I'm still dealing with the after effects, PTSD, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia. My entitled mum pleaded with court to get him off charges and they were dropped. She went back to him pretty quickly. Now, my entitled mum and her boyfriend are back in my home country. They're trying to build a life here and my mum has stated she has moved back to work on relationships with my sister and I. That is BS though. The boyfriend sent a trashy two-line email apology. Through therapy, I've decided to forgive them both and I've worked on my relationship with my mum and even seen the boyfriend a few times. This took a long time to get to this stage. My sister doesn't even want to set eyes on the boyfriend and I 100% support her decision. She's still working on a relationship with mum. Now, Christmas is coming up and it's tradition in our family to have a family brunch. Never missed a year except once when mum was stuck overseas due to COVID. 
So I call mum to chat about plans and she is now annoyed that her boyfriend isn't invited He's not welcome at our home ever. I think that's a fair boundary She said things like I can't keep choosing between you and my boyfriend and how long is it gonna take? He did that thing over two years ago and what does he have to do for you to accept him, etc. So now I doubt she's going to come to Christmas and I think this may be the last straw in our relationship. I've worked so hard on my own mental stability after all this trash and I no longer want to be a second option for her. I just don't know how I could live with myself if I cut her off, but I may have to. Thanks for letting me vent. Now also OP has added this little section to answer a couple of questions about how on earth the boyfriend got off on five attempted murder charges. To answer, I don't really know. I left the country straight after the incident and went through the police process which took about two days we pressed charges at the station and then flew home from there all info about the court process i got was through my mother looking back i'm not sure how much of what she said is true it must be said that the country this happened in is a tiny pacific island that is well known for its awful policing and justice system for example it took two to three hours for the police to show up while i was screaming down the phone that the boyfriend was outside taunting us and trying to get in domestic violence is very common in this country and not a lot is done about it there's also not a lot of police resources my mother is also best friends with the chief of police's wife there's a language barrier too i speak english and the home country speaks mostly broken english and their native tongue at the time i was too traumatized to pursue legal action and i stupidly trusted my mother to push for the charges to stick instead of trying to get him off them yeah no it makes sense doesn't it oh i'm so annoyed that my boyfriend isn't allowed to come to christmas despite the fact that he threatened to kill literally everyone where's the logic once again it blows my mind. Tell you what, you tried to murder your girlfriend and her daughters once and they can't even take the joke? Come on, it's Christmas, the time of forgiveness. Invite him round, it just makes sense. Screaming brat doesn't get what he wants. Just a quick story of a time I was petty enough to spend money to deny a spoiled brat a cool toy. A few years ago, while working overseas for the military, I was doing some quick shopping at my base exchange. While standing in an aisle looking at some cleaning items, I began to hear in the distance the sound of what felt like a screaming bat slash goat hybrid that just proceeded to get louder and louder. I looked out of the aisle to see the possible cryptid, but just saw a screaming little boy being pushed in a shopping cart by his mum. People around them were looking annoyed as the kid was practically screeching at the top of his lungs over and over again I want it. I want the big gun I want the big gun and pointing at the toy aisle a few rows down while passing by me I overheard the mum telling her son not now sweetie Mummy has to get to the makeup counter. We'll pick it up on the way out This rubbed me the wrong way. Not only was this mother okay with how her son was acting But she was also going to reward him I then got curious and decided to go to the toy aisle to see this big gun I turned the corner and immediately saw what he was talking about and i'll give the kid credit He has good taste because on the shelf was the biggest nerf gun i've ever seen It was called the titan cs50 and it was just a straight up mini gun Think of the heavy weapons guy from team fortress after spending a few minutes admiring it and daydreaming about how I would have Absolutely destroyed my friends in the nerf gun fires We had as kids with this monster. I then realized that this nerf gun was the last one on the shelf I immediately grabbed it and then found a store employee to ask a few questions. Excuse me. Can I ask a few questions about this toy? Yes, sir. What would you like to know? Is this the last one you have? Like, is there any more in the back? Let me check. The employee then leaves the back of the store for a few minutes and then returns to tell me the best news possible. Hey, sir. Yeah, that one you're holding is the last one of that toy we have. I also checked on our computer and there also doesn't seem to be any more in stock in the other closet exchange stores or on our online store. So if you want to get it, you better get it now because I also don't think we're going to be getting any more anytime soon. I then smile at the Grinch when he has a wonderfully awful idea. Thank you. I then immediately proceeded straight to check out and bought the nerf youngling slayer 2000 But the cherry on top was what happened after I bought my new toy I went back into the store to make sure that the mini banshee knew what I just bought I found him still in the shopping cart next to the makeup counter with his mum talking to a salesperson I casually walked by in front of the kid with the nerf bfg under my arm And what happened next was most definitely worth the price tag The look of shock and fear just completely took over this kid's face as he starts to scream as well as yank on his mum's sleeve and point at me i just disappear into another aisle and proclaim that my job was now done while leaving the store they must have rushed back to the toy aisle because i again could hear the ear-piercing screeches of that little crotch goblin coming from the toy aisle screaming it's gone it's gone Ah!" i usually don't like the sound of screaming kids but that might as well have been a live aerosmith performance because that was just pure audible chocolate to me 
And while leaving, I walked past the guy entering the store who could also hear the screaming kid. Jesus Christ, what the heck is that? He says, ah, most likely a mistake. Okay, now I don't know exactly how much this Nerf gun costs, and it's actually been discontinued now from the Nerf range, which is a real shame because I would have loved to get one myself. However, let me tell you, from what I can just see online, it's only on eBay and sites like that now because you can't officially buy it anymore, but it's not cheap is what I would say. It's about £100, it seems to be. Now, Nerf fans out there, if you're watching, let me know down below how much did it cost back in the day. I don't know. All I will say is it's quite a lot of money just for a little joke. And that is why I love it. To be honest, I really hope that you never actually used the OP and you just, you know, kept it in your attic just for the sake of it. Just to be petty. I adore it. I really do. Because that kid, he didn't deserve it. And ultimately, it's the mother's parenting that didn't deserve the gun. I mean, look, for the kid, it's a bit harsh. For the mum, though, it's glorious. Lady complained to California fish grill manager to make me move tables and got arrested. So this just happened and I'm pretty bent about it. I went to California fish grill, CFG, for a late lunch. It was a pretty standard ordeal. I ordered my meal, grabbed a drink and made sure to grab a small table with only two seats so I wouldn't take up too much space. Not that it really mattered because the restaurant was fairly empty with plenty of tables. As I'm casually sitting at this small table for two, an older lady came up and asked me to move. I was a bit puzzled because she came in after me. The table I was at appeared to be untaken and there were plenty of other available tables. I asked why and she said she wanted a table big enough for her and her son. At this point, I told her I wasn't going to inconvenience myself when there were plenty of other open tables. She could simply go and sit elsewhere with her son. So she started getting frustrated with me and telling me I needed to respect my elders and that her son would not be able to sit at another table. I just ignored her though because it wasn't my problem. So this lady walks off and tells the manager that I took her table and was refusing to give it back to her. She brings the manager over and explains that her son is very upset that I took their table and it was hurting his feelings. We had a few minutes of back and forth before the manager just gives me this look of, I don't make enough money to deal with this. Please just move. So whatever, I get up, go to another table and this lady just glares at me. I glare back and she's sitting all by herself. At first, I thought she was just a liar and didn't have a son. Maybe she just wanted to abuse what little power she had. After like 10 minutes though, this guy walks in with a full suit and tie, maybe 40 to 50 years old, and approaches this lady and calls her mum. They exchange some words and he starts glaring at me too. At this point, I'm just annoyed and trying to eat my lunch in peace. Then her son, a grown ass man, shouts at me across the restaurant and asks if I think it's funny to disrespect his mum like that. And I just look at him puzzled because I've got no idea what he's talking about. He shouts again. Yeah, you in the hat. So I just ignore him because this is stupid. As he continued to harass me, I decided to just flip him the bird. This lady and her son lost their minds. They got up yelling, screaming, and generally causing a scene. The son started threatening to kick my butt. He asked me if I liked being such a smart ass. So of course, I had to let him know it was better than being a dumb ass. Anyway, this commotion resulted in the police being called by the manager. They showed up after an unclear amount of time, walked right up to this lady and her son, and asked them to leave. The lady starts going off about how I stole her table, was harassing her, and how I started it. Now, this poor police officer looks down at me, casually sitting at my table, eating my salmon, and tells this ancient woman that I don't seem to be bothering anyone. So the lady signals out the manager, hoping that they will corroborate her story, and the manager explains in great detail that this woman had come in and started harassing me. She asked the woman and her son to leave, and they both refused because they pay for their food, and so they had a right to sit at any table for as long as they wanted. After refusing to leave, this hag of a woman and her son were cuffed and escorted away. I made sure to move to her table as she left, just to rub the salt in the wound. Okay, an interesting one to finish there. Maybe it's because this woman thought her son was so high and mighty, you know? In a suit, probably coming from some swanky office job. Not that anyone actually cares. It's a restaurant, like, it's a grill shop. Sit down, eat your food, and go. But I don't know. She clearly felt entitled to a table. Maybe they have a set table that they normally go to when they eat and meet at this place. Not that anybody would ever have to care about that. I don't really know what's going on here. To be honest, looking at this, yeah, arresting them is a little bit harsh, but they were refusing to leave a private property, right? And they were being a public nuisance. And arguably, they were harassing you. So the more I think about it, the more I think that arrest was kind of deserved. Old man parks his car in the middle of the road. Somehow I'm at fault. Something bizarre happened to me yesterday. I was pulling into a parking lot when the car in front of me suddenly came to a complete stop in the middle of the lane. Its owner, an older white man, turned it off, got out, and started walking into the nearest store in the strip mall. He just parked his car in the middle of the lane. Now, I could have gotten around it if I'd really tried, but it would be dangerously close to either his car or other parked cars. I lightly tapped my horn twice at him, seeing as how I was essentially stuck now. He turned around and I rolled my window down and said to him, that's not a parking space. 
He dramatically pointed at my car and then did this right this way motion with both hands, sort of aiming at the very narrow path that I guess he thought I should be able to get through. I repeated myself again. Sir, that's not a parking space. I can't get around you. Why is it that one of you people every time just go around? Sir, what are you doing? That's not a parking space. I need you to move. I need you to mind your own business. Oh, come on. You can't park there. Please just move your car. At this point, his lips were doing that weird shake that old people do when they hang their mouths open. I guess he thought he was being intimidating. He stepped up to my window and yelled. You want to make me? Okay, so he's done this before and he's being an aggressive jerk. Now, I've read on here where other people have interacted with older Karens. And there's apparently a card that you can play that bypasses this sort of attitude. Sir, are you okay? Do you know where you are? What? Are you with someone? Is there someone who's supposed to be helping you today? What are you? Do you need help? It sounds like you don't know where you are and I'm worried for you. Is there anyone I can call for you to help you? I think he caught on to me at this point because he switched back from confused to being angry again. I don't know. Is there anyone I can call for you? Is that somehow a threat? I don't even know. Sir, it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. You just stay right there and I'll call someone who can come help you. Don't worry. It will be okay. Just don't move and I'll call for an ambulance. At this point, I backed into a parking space that had opened behind me and pulled out my phone. I really was going to call 911, but only because he was too confrontational to be left unattended in public. Of course, as with most bullies, the moment they realized they don't have power over you, he gave up, muttered something, got back in his car, and left. On my way out of the lot, I saw that he'd miraculously found his way into a parking spot on the other side of it. Yeah, I can't say that I've ever actually experienced this or even seen this in my life before. Someone just parking in the middle of the road and legit getting out and saying, yeah, that's fine. How is that even possible? Especially given that we now know there were other spaces available that this old geezer could have gone into at any moment, but no, he wanted to park in the middle of the road and just said, oh, you're one of those people that gets annoyed with me parking in the middle of the road? Yeah, everyone, my friend. (laughs) Gotta say though, OP, fantastic response from you. Playing the card of, yeah, this guy must have some troubles and making him think that you're actually pitying him. I know he clocked on eventually. And I also know that you said that you've read it on this subreddit before. I'm not sure I've ever seen that though. And if you didn't know, I've requested this sub quite a lot. Very smart. Well played. Trust me, you don't want your own toilet. So this happened when I was 23. I recently started my job as an engineer in training with a firm in the structural engineering department. My firm thought it was important for the new guys to have experience on site while our projects were being built, as this helps us to understand what construction crews need to see on our plans, as well as getting an understanding of how to address issues that come up during construction. So I was working as an inspector on an overpass construction project. I have world-class IBS, and this had peaked when I was 23, to the point where I had to wear a diaper any time I was out of the house. This was considered a disability, and my firm had to provide me with my outpour to John that I was the only one who had a key for right outside of the job trailer. The construction crew hated this, and I had so many snide comments and flack thrown my way for it. They thought I just thought I was too good to use the toilets provided for the crew. The lock on the Porta John was cut off several times, and they replaced it with one I didn't have the key for. This was really frustrating, but it was easy enough to get around. This culminated with someone putting an eco block, a several thousand pound concrete block, in front of my toilet so I didn't have access to it. During the safety meeting the next morning, these happened every morning, I stood up and told them about what someone had done to general snickering. And then, and as I had stopped giving a frick about what people thought about my issue, said, As soon as any of you have to wear a diaper at all times, I flashed the band of my diaper, then you can get your own toilet as well dead silence. I don't think I could have made these guys more uncomfortable than I did by admitting my incontinence. Never had an issue with anyone on the crew again after that. Got on new meds a few months later, which helped immensely. Honestly, there aren't many things much worse that I can think of off the top of my head than having this. I mean, come on, having to wear a diaper at 23 must just be truly awful. And OP, I'm so sorry that you have this condition. And then to compound matters, you get picked on and bullied for having your own toilet. I mean, come on, ridiculous. Fair play to you for having the bravery and the courage to do what you did though. Gotta say, standing up to these guys and making them shut their mouths, unreal from you. Takes a lot of balls, if I can say that, but fair play for doing it, mate. Unreal. And again, super sorry that you're in that situation. My worst college roommate. Back in my undergrad, I lived in the dorms for all four years. Lots of reasons for that, not worth getting into. I had some wonderful roommates, but this one was the worst. I had a room due to a disability. Mine is not obvious. This is actually important. My roommate, Fran, was moved into my room about two weeks into the semester. I'd been single in a double room for a while just through pure luck. I didn't object to a new roomie. It was supposed to be two to a room. 
This person's disability was obvious, though I will not share what because it's only relevant that it was obvious. I found out quickly that she used this as an excuse to be awful to everyone. She would rarely leave the room. Only one of her classes was online, but the rest were meant to be in person. She spent the rest of time in our room in bed watching reality TV. I used the microwave to make my breakfast in the morning. She hated that and started shouting at me to stop one morning. I hate conflict, so I just obliged. We went to a smaller university, so this was literally the most convenient thing to do. The only other thing was either walking all the way to the restaurants or going to a convenience store. I tried to accommodate her only to my own detriment. My health suffered from the amount of fast food I was eating because she couldn't deal with the fact that a microwave makes noises. She only escalated from there. I don't fully recall everything, but I get sick with respiratory stuff when I get extremely stressed, and she made me that stressed constantly. I was sick so much between my stress and diet. Luckily, anytime I had a fever, she had to vacate the room. I was sick with a high fever four times in two months because of the stress of living with her. I knew her life had to be hard, so I was just a doormat. It came to a head one night when I was studying for a test. Remember what I said about reality TV? She watched it on a very high volume too. I asked her to turn it down. Not off down i wasn't rude about it at all something like hey would you turn down your tv a little bit please i have a huge test tomorrow she huffs and with all the sarcasm she could physically muster she turns off the tv throws her remote on the bed starts throwing on her coat and calls a friend and says in a near shout yeah my roommate is kicking me out the room I was so shocked I didn't even know what to say. She then turns to me and says, You know, common areas are for studying. That's where you should be if it's that important. I managed to stammer out, It's my room too. And no, that is not what the common areas are usually used for in this dorm. That was absolutely true, by the way. Video game parties dominated those rooms. The next day, I'm emailed by the hall director, who says my roommate has lodged a complaint about me and we are required to go to her office for a meeting. My roomie had told the hall director all this bull about me kicking her out. The meeting was just my roomie shouting at and about me and it became very obvious very quickly that the hall director didn't believe her. The hall director tried to be as neutral as she could, but it was very hard with my roomie just shouting. Thank God I built up credibility with the hall director before this. After the meeting ended, with Fran just storming out, the hall director told me that this girl had moved a couple of times already before she was placed with me. It turns out she picked fights with everyone. This was not new behavior. She moved out just days later. I got to enjoy the last month of the semester with a new roommate who was wonderful. I wasn't sick at all in that last month. I've since learned to stand up for myself, but holy heck, I've never felt anxiety paralysis like that since her. Now look, this story epitomizes why... I would hate to have to share a room with someone in a college dorm. I was fortunate enough when I went to university that I didn't have to, but some people in my dorm did have to. And let me tell you, it doesn't even matter, I think, if you really get on with your roommate. Still, it's not going to be ideal, is it? I don't know. It's just, it, maybe it's just not for me, but I need my own personal space. And no, not for that reason, you weirdos. Just for my own personal space. Like, I know it makes sense given that space is probably quite limited on campuses and stuff like that, but for the sanity, of individual students shared sleeping areas oh, just shouldn't be a thing if you can help it because even if you get an amazing roommate like you got later on i still don't think i'd love it oh and living with someone like fran nah i'm done getting sick four times in two months because of your roommate no thank you old geezer clearly doesn't know how long it takes to cook a ton of food this happened decades ago when i was in my 20s a couple of friends and i went to the local fish and chip shop also known as takeaway here in new zealand this takeaway like most was run by a chinese family this will become relevant later when we got there there were a few people milling around in that i've already ordered and now i'm just waiting for my food mode and about one person waiting in front of us the three of us stood in line the person in front finished paying for their order, but before we were served, the phone rang and the bloke behind the counter took a lengthy order. I wasn't exactly listening in, but I was within two meters and it was impossible not to get the idea that the caller was ordering half of the menu. One of the things it was impossible not to hear was when he said that the order would be ready in 20 minutes. When the bloke hung up and posted the order up to be filled, we placed our own not insubstantial orders and went to join the others in the I've ordered and I'm just waiting for my Kai pattern. Kai is the Mary word for food we lose people as their food becomes ready and they depart with their newsprint wrap packages of delight then about 15 minutes after the phone call this tall skinny old bloke whom we shall call the oc for reasons that i think are fairly obvious but you can pretend that it means old chap if you like turns up and asks if his phone order is ready the bloke behind the counter bbc checks and says it's not ready yet this is where in new zealand culture you say okay 
pay for the food you ordered and go and join the others waiting for their order to be completed. The old chap, however, elected to lose his temper and say that it should be ready now. The bloke behind the counter basically reminds him that 15 minutes ago, he said it would be ready in 20 minutes. But this guy was having none of this and was getting quite ranty, saying, perhaps I should just forget about it then. At your typical Kiwi takeaway fish and chip shop, the deep fry vats, burger prep area, and gas hops with the woks are all clearly visible from the ordering waiting area. And you can see the staff cooking your food. So I could see looks of absolute horror on the faces of the staff working behind the counter as they've got a metric F ton of this old chap's food in the process of being cooked back there. And the old chap hasn't actually paid for any of this yet. The bloke behind the counter says, no, your food's nearly ready. It's ready? Well, everything is cooked except the burgers and we're doing the burgers now. So it's not ready, is it? And then he launches into a tirade about how the food should be ready by now, as if he'd ordered only a couple of things and he were the only customer in the store. Two things about me at this point. One, I love languages and learn phrases from them from my friends whenever possible. Of course, quite often these phrases include the ones you don't use in mixed company, unless you're a New Zealander or an Australian, of course. One of the languages in which I know a few words, including not for mixed company words, was Cantonese. I told you the fact that the shop was run by Chinese people would become relevant. And two, I do not like entitled chaps mistreating serving staff. From my view, the old chap has phoned up and ordered a literal fortune's worth of food and been told 20 minutes, and he's now threatening to walk out without paying for the food because it's not ready in 15. This is just not done. So I cut him off mid ran by loudly and angrily yelling a Cantonese phrase that pretty much translates to mother effer, possibly horse effer if I got the inflection of one of the words wrong. I was glaring daggers at the old chap's back, but I could see all the staff beyond him abruptly look up in shock at my outburst and then realizing who had shouted and at whom they all grinned. My loud interjection did stop the old guy mid ran, but he didn't look around. I'm pretty sure he knew exactly who was being yelled at. I doubt he understood the Cantonese, but he probably could recognize angry in any language. In the silence that followed, the bloke behind the counter reiterated that the burgers were almost done and the meal would be ready. I'd already decided that if the old chap walked out of that shop without paying, I'd be following him down the street and confronting him about it, letting him know in no uncertain terms that you don't do that sort of thing. Fortunately, he did decide to pay for his food and wait like the rest of us, so I didn't need to chase him down the street and discuss his parentage. Yeah, nothing worse than rushing people that are literally making your food for you in front of your own eyes than if they've told you it's going to be 20 minutes and you come in at 15 minutes. I mean, look, rushing someone in the first place is bad enough because look, the food takes as long as it takes. But if they've literally told you it's going to be 20 minutes and you're getting at them when they still have five minutes of that time left to go, then you're just entitled. Simple as that. I'm very thankful though that he didn't do what he threatened to do and walk out and cost this company loads of money and just you know ruin loads of food for no reason it's people like uop that have stopped him from doing that so fair play but wow the audacity to even suggest that is disgraceful now the last post in this episode comes from a user that has posted many stories in the past all about entitled people in her life and this is just their most recent account ex-husband is angry that i am hot and moved on from him in truth life is amazing right now since my last post i've dropped enough weight and i'm in the best shape of my life i go to the gym four times a week all the while balancing my job and raising my kids maintaining my home along with pole dancing classes i'm on my way to becoming a dancer but for now i'm sticking with bartending while doing private dances at the club i'm making great money i've even started seeing one of the bouncers at my job we'll call him kyle he's a sweet caring man who isn't afraid to speak his mind he's former military he's really good looking too think Jax teller from sons of anarchy they could be twins Yes, he knows about my past. Carl is one of those social media junkies that likes posting just about everything on his Facebook. One night out at dinner, he took a photo of us together and posted it with the caption, future wife. As sweet and adorable as that is, I did ask him to take it down as I'm not totally comfortable being on social media just yet. But by then, the damage was already done. One of the more cattier girls, Samantha, at the club, is mutual friends with my ex, Bill. She knows he's my ex-husband and is aware of the divorce and all the drama. She's that type of girl that likes to stir up a bunch of trash, then sit back and watch the fallout with a gleeful smile on her face. If she wasn't friends with my boss's wife, he would have fired her a long time ago. She routinely shows up late, gossips about everyone she works with, has drank herself into a stupor more than once, and beaten up a client when he didn't pay her more than she thought she deserved. And that was all after I started working there a few months ago. 
She's incredibly toxic and most of us just avoid her long story short She saved the picture and showed bill and he went postal Samantha came into work a couple of days ago and informed me that bill somehow found out about kyle And he's really upset and has made threats to come to my job as mad as I was, I told her I didn't care. She horribly feigned sympathy and wished me luck. I informed my boss and Kyle of what Samantha had said. They assured me they would keep a lookout and not to worry. Last night during my shift, I'm behind the bar serving drinks like usual. Ever since Samantha told me Bill was making threats to come to my job, I've been nervously keeping one eye on the door at all times. Sure enough, he shows up with two of his equally douchey friends. It was almost comical how alike they looked. Slick back hair, polos tucked into dress pants, blazers and freaking sunglasses at night. I wanted to bury my head into the floor in shame for having seen anything in this man or considered him marriage material. I try to ignore him and go back to serving drinks. He notices me and makes a beeline for the bar with thing one and two following right behind him. This is when he's intercepted by my boss, Kyle, and one other bouncer, Greg. I couldn't hear the conversation between them over the music playing but i could tell from their body language that things were getting heated it began to draw a crowd pretty fast and before i knew what happened kyle grabbed bill up by his jacket and proceeded to usher bill out the door kicking and screaming while greg and my boss escorted thing one and two out after him it was pretty anticlimactic but i'm glad no one was hurt mostly After work was finished, I asked Kyle what was said. He told me Bill was fuming that I couldn't bother to improve myself during our marriage and I'd moved on and he wanted me back. When Kyle established that he was the man in my life, Bill called me a couple of slurs and some other colorful words. That was when Kyle grabbed him up and violently threw him out of the club onto his butt in the parking lot and said that if he harassed me again, he would frick him up. My effing hero. Thing one and two came out right after and helped Bill to his feet. They got in the car with their pride wounded and peeled out of that parking lot. I'm thankful the situation didn't escalate and so far bill hasn't tried showing up to my apartment I'm hoping he takes Carl's warning seriously. I'm happily moving on with my life And there we go op good to hear that you're doing well in this day and age and you know what it's pretty embarrassing from this bloke right just because you didn't improve yourself when i was with you oh i now want you back are you saying that maybe she lost a couple of kilos a couple of pounds and now you're attracted to her again and therefore you want a relationship with her i mean maybe i get it but not really it's just very superficial isn't it if you're only into someone because of how they look then that's pretty poor not gonna lie and i don't think it was gonna last that long anyway let's be honest with each other i mean to be fair it sounds like you just dodged a huge red flag the fact that he's come to your place of work threatened to go to your apartment with his goons calling you all these slurs yeah not the sort of geezer you want in your life i think we can all agree on that you're too old to see santa Alrighty, little bit of background info. One, I'm 20. Two, I'm Jewish. And three, I work in a toy store at my local mall. So the get your photo with Santa thing is right in front of the toy store at the mall I work at, which makes sense. Kids can look around while their parents wait in line. Parents can look for present ideas while their kids wait in line. They can all come in together after getting their photos taken, etc. This happened today at around 11 a.m. I've been working at the toy store and my boss let me know I can go on my break. So I do. I had about 30 minutes to kill and I wasn't particularly hungry, but when I walked by the Santa exhibit, I saw there was almost no lineup because it was a weekday in the middle of the day. Most kids are at school and most parents are working. So since I'm an adult and don't celebrate Christmas, I thought a picture of me on Santa's lap would be a funny gift to give to my family on Hanukkah when I'm home. So I get in line. There's one family who currently has their kids seeing Santa, one kid in front of me, and not long after our entitled mother, entitled father, and their kids. They were all very lovely at first. We made a little bit of small talk while we waited. I asked their kids how excited they were to see Santa, etc. The family in front of me goes in, and in hindsight, I think the gears were starting to turn in the mother's head that i wasn't just an older sibling and was actually there for myself the family in front of me leaves i get to tell the patron saint of prostitutes no seriously look it up what i want for the holiday i don't celebrate and i get my pictures and yes i will include it in the comments wow looking forward to that i go back to work and clock back in because even without the lineup just waiting for two families and getting the pictures printed and paid for took most of my lunch break and a few minutes later the family from before comes in the kids go off to look at toys i give them a friendly little hi again and i met with a very cold-hearted hello from the mother our store wasn't very busy either given the day of the week and time of day so while they browsed i was showing my co-workers and boss the pictures that i got for poops and giggles and the mum stomps over over, like i just pooed in her figgy pudding i'm sorry i just think it's very rude and immature to keep my kids waiting longer just for a joke there was no way at least not to see santa i said 
Ugh, you're too old to believe in this rubbish. Keep in mind, her kids were the only kids in the store and she was yelling. But I've never believed in it. I don't actually celebrate Christmas, I say. A little quieter because I'm actually capable of being courteous. Well, that's a whole other reason why you shouldn't have been there. You're ruining it for everyone else. Well, it doesn't really matter. Santa says I'm on the nice list and his word is law. I was very obviously screwing with them the whole time. It's a weird coping mechanism where I tried to escape conflict by being funny. Well, God says you're going to burn in hell. And then she says the F slur. I'm Jewish. We don't have hell. Now, this isn't entirely true, I don't think. I'm not particularly religious, but I know some sects of Judaism say we don't have a hell. Others believe that it's more of a temporary thing where you spend some time atoning and then get to go to heaven. I was just using the best comeback I could think of. Then my boss gets involved. All right, I'm going to need you to leave if you're going to keep harassing my employee. The kids come back to find their parents. One asked if they could have one of the candy canes we have on our checkout counter. The mum said no. I said they were free and to go ahead. Both kids took a candy cane because free candy totally outweighs their mother's word, which is actually kind of a scary thought without context. The mum stared daggers at me, called me a name that rhymes with bike as they left, and I just smirked and gave a very happy Merry Christmas. My boss and co-workers are still laughing about it with me as I write this. We call them Kanye's parents for, well, obvious reasons. And here we go. Here we have the picture of OP with Santa. I mean, look, yeah, it's a bit funny, especially given the context of them not believing in Santa, obviously, and not being even Christian or whatever, you know, celebrating Hanukkah. But still, like, there's no harm, is there? It's just a photo that probably took about 10 seconds, and that was it. I don't know why this entitled woman was getting so irate. Now for our next entitled parent story. My mum feels entitled to my inheritance money. She wants to use it to put a down payment on a house. I only found out about it six years later because I looked into a cabinet in our house and did some research. I am a 24-year-old woman, and I found out earlier this year that I was supposed to receive around $160,000 in inheritance money when my father passed away. I found out by looking into a cabinet in our house. I was compelled to do so because my mother acts rich or poor whenever it suits her and her other strange behavior. I found a letter that was addressed specifically to me from the life insurance company that had my inheritance. All I needed to do was submit some paperwork and they'd give me a check. I'm not sure how, but my mother somehow submitted documents for me and even cashed a check that was in my name. I'm also not sure why she felt entitled to it when she got $500,000 in inheritance herself. When I confronted her about it, she obviously did not take it well. She was very adamant that it's her money until I informed her that after I found the documents, I called the life insurance company and received photocopies of the check, the submitted documents and more. After I told her that, she tried negotiating with me, stating that she can give me $10,000 to start with and then $2,000 every month. I said no. I said she's going to guilt me into delaying her payments if we go that route. She tells me that she'll be homeless if I get all the money at once. I eventually make her show me her bank statements. As far as I know, she has around $330,000. In addition, she's been making six figures with her job for the past three years. Homeless my butt. I told her I need a good amount of money if I want to have any chance of moving out. I wanted to move out with my friend, but my mum took way too long to give me any money. I received $50,000 from her. Like a week or so later, she started asking if she could borrow $20,000 for a month. She said she needs it in her bank account so that the lender can approve of the condo or house she wants to buy. She asked if I would be okay, and I stupidly told her that I'd be getting grants from school too. She then wanted to borrow $20,000 on top of the grant money by passive-aggressively mentioning it whenever she could. A few weeks later, she forced me to go with her to the bank to withdraw $20K. This was on October the 3rd. On November 23rd, I asked her to give me $2,000. I told her it's been almost two months and I want a portion of it back via text. She gives me the silent treatment, in text and in person. The next day, I try calling her and she starts crying hysterically, saying, I knew I shouldn't have trusted you with money. What are you doing? Drugs? Are you gambling? Why are you so mean? You ruined my holiday. You've ruined my life. You're abnormal. You're just doing this because you're behind in your life and you're desperate. You don't have utilities to pay for. I spent so much money on food the past month. I'm not exaggerating when I say I've never told her to buy me food or make me food, but she always uses it as a form of guilt. A couple of days later, we have a four hour argument. During this argument, I was so disgusted with her behavior that I told her that I want nothing to do with her. A couple of days after that, to my surprise, she comes into my room and asks me to hug her. She starts crying and says that she just suppresses my thoughts and feelings. She says she'll give me $500 now and then $500 on December 22nd, What the heck? I swallowed my anger for a couple of days, but then I could no longer hold it in. I wasn't giving her the silent treatment, but I wasn't looking at her or initiating any form of talking. 
She notices this and starts asking what's wrong. She goes, it's the money, isn't it? And then repeats the same thing she did last time. Are you gambling? You have no utilities, etc. And again, she made it very clear that she wants to buy a condo or a house. I can't really remember which. I told her I'm mad at her because you told me you needed 20k for a month. It's been over two months and now you're still not giving it. So you lied. After this, she started acting like she was about to cry and then she left the house. She then transferred another $500. I haven't talked to her since it infuriates me that she thinks she's entitled to this money Why do you need a house? You're getting old and you're single Secondly, not only was this money only in your account in the first place because you committed fraud But now I let you borrow money and you're going to treat it like it's an allowance. It's my money legally get over it You already got 500,000 before you took my money since I was 18, I've been working minimum wage jobs. She's made it so clear as day that she thinks her needs are way above mine. I don't have utilities. I don't have a career yet. So therefore, I'm less important. Even if that is factually true, I'm your child and that money is legally mine. Also, I just want to share this example of her behavior that I just remembered. When I was 19, I was working at a tutoring place in addition to a restaurant while taking 16 units in college with no car. I was leaving the house one day to go and get a haircut. My mum then asked me, where are you going? I told her I'm going to get a haircut. She then says, verbatim, really? You're supposed to be using that money to help me. Like that is how entitled she is. Oh my God. At this point, she received $660,000 while her child, a full-time student with two jobs and no car, is not important enough to use the money they just earned from their job to get a haircut. I'm so mad. And I just have a huge, huge problem with getting this taken care of because I hate making people uncomfortable. This is also why I usually cannot blindside a person by randomly bringing an issue up. I usually have to text them first, but I'm starting to think that's never a good idea. Ugh. Now with this story, I feel like I could get into the technicalities of your relationship and say your mum shouldn't be doing this for X reason. You should let her do this for a reason, but you should be angry for this reason, etc, etc. But this is the simplicity of the story, right? She is frauded you out of money. It's as simple as that. Legally, that is your cash and she has stolen it from you. It doesn't matter what relation she is to you. That isn't her money. It's yours. She might as well be some random robber, some random stranger that's stolen that cash from you. That is in effect what she's done. So therefore, you're left with a couple of options. First of all, you try and, you know, solve it amicably, which is kind of what you've tried to do. But clearly that's not really working. So I would suggest at this point, you have no other option. Go to law enforcement. Get your cash if you want it that badly, which I'm sure you do. Like you just have to sue her at this point, right? She's falsified documents, stolen your money. No other option press charges. And look, I get it. It's tough because she is your mother. And obviously you would never want a situation like this to happen, but it's already gone too far. Like there's insurance fraud there. There's identity theft. There's so much going on. At the end of the day, you need to get your money back. So yes, sue her. My daughter decks an entitled mum over a toy. So I didn't think these stories were real. I always thought they were over-exaggerated and these entitled mums couldn't possibly be real. Well, enter this entitled woman who entered our lives today. So with a big lit up holiday centered around a fat man in a red suit and a baby being born, my kids needed to buy presents for their friends. With the entire family being sick for most of December, we finally got to a store. Now, I only took three of the five kids as my wife took the other two. One very important thing to point out is my six-year-old son is mildly autistic. He's also a sponge when it comes to learning and is a grade ahead. But without stimulation, he can be a nightmare. We're still working on that. We told him no tablet, but that he could bring any toy he wanted. So he brought this puzzle cube. We were walking through the store and I told my oldest, an 11-year-old girl, to watch her brother as I had their four-year-old brother. We were in the toy section when I hear my son scream. I turned to see my daughter wrenching the toy out of another kid's hands and yelling at him. It's not yours. Let go. She eventually got the toy and I got between them and the kids started to hit me. I pushed him back a little bit and said very loudly, instant regret as my throat was still sore, no hitting. He then rushed past me and went after my daughter who was still holding the cube. My daughter just pushed the kid down the aisle. At this point, other parents are starting to get involved. The kid came to swing at my daughter again and she once again threw him to the ground. It was at this point the boy's entitled mother showed up and instead of taking care of her demon spawn, she grabbed my daughter's hair. My daughter turned around quickly and hit her right in the stomach. This woman then tried to hit my my daughter back and my daughter ended up just punching her in the face the chaos ended and it wasn't until this point that i could actually see all that was going on i was busy restraining the little devil my sons were being looked after by a very nice lady and the entitled mum was sitting on the floor crying it was then i heard a deep james earl jones kind of voice come from behind me saying hey mac let me take care of that i didn't understand what he meant so i just responded what 
And he replied, that's my son. And that, stop crying, you started this mess, is my wife. She looked up at him and yelled something obscene. And he very calmly said, get up, apologize, and maybe they won't press charges. She snapped with, you're a trashy husband. In the aftermath, a lot happened. So I'll just sum it up. The police were called, cameras were looked at. The entitled mum was arrested for assaulting a minor. The demon spawn was forced by his father to apologize to everyone. The manager apologized to the point I got annoyed and the manager gave us a discount on our order. Oh, and remember the nice lady? Well, she is a special education teacher, so that was lucky. And finally, my daughter was allowed to get a game of her choice because daddy is proud of her. I also just wanted to add, my daughter has been boxing for about three years now. She'll be entering her first real six round match in two months. The dad was apparently just biding his time to divorce his wife he was waiting to make sure that when he did he would get full custody he never thought though that she would pull a stunt like she did yesterday now reading this you may not be able to realize that this all happened in less than five minutes i took my eye off my daughter for about a second to grab the demon spawn to stop him from hitting people when the entire mum grabbed my daughter the two punches were very quick and finally one more update all right i just got back from the police station with my daughter we had to do some quick paperwork and verify we agree with their official timeline of events We were informed that we may have to testify in court. My attorney stated we could be forced to testify in this case, but we may not have to. So the entire mum is facing assaulting a minor and endangering the welfare of a child, both of which are felonies. She's also facing charges for resisting arrest, assaulting a police officer, vandalism, and there's one more charge that I can't remember the name of, but it's to deal with her lying to the police. I spoke with the father today and he said that he is seeking counsel for divorce. He also offered to buy a new phone to replace my daughter's broken phone to avoid court fees. I don't know if there'll be another update, but my attorney said this case will go quickly because the entitled mum is facing felony charges. My daughter's fine, though the mark she has on her face has darkened. The doctor says not to worry about it. I'm very proud of her, not only for standing up for herself and her brother, but for showing restraint while doing it. After the second punch, she just stood there, ready to swing again. She also remained calm when the officers said they had to handcuff her till they found out who the aggressor was. My son, on the other hand, is not doing okay. The kid actually kicked my son and he had a bad cut in his leg, needing four stitches. It took us a while to realize it as he shut down during this time. As I said, a lot happened. And there we go. Can I just say off the rip, props to your daughter for standing up for herself and her brother, as you said, because that is nuts. Like if I was 11 years old and an entire woman came after me, I don't know what I'd do. I don't think I'd have the, I don't want to say balls, but you know what I mean? To, um, slap a woman in the face, punch, kick, whatever. I'd probably just cowered away at that age. So you know what? Fair play to her. That's nuts. You can literally tell at the end of the story, the husband is just so done, isn't he? Like the fact that he's so calm when a situation like this is happening shows it's probably not the first time it's happening. And the fact that he literally addresses his wife while coming over in the first place to say, no, you shut up. You cause all of this. Brilliant to see. It does seem like he was definitely pining for a divorce and this was probably the final nail in the coffin. Or maybe he was actually just waiting for this to happen. So we get custody, as you said. My stepmother keeps a huge picture of my ex in the living room backstory i was previously married to a man i came out as lesbian two years in things ended as mutually as possible but we don't talk and we've been divorced for five years now my stepmother apparently never got over it she keeps a huge framed picture of us dressed up in the living room I've asked her to take it down many times. In a heated argument, it got knocked off the wall and broke. She charged me for the repair, even though she hit it while trying to point at it. Fast forward. Well, I had a wonderful girlfriend about two years ago. She was intelligent, funny, and quirky cute. She begged me for months to meet my parents. We've been dating for a little over a year and met all my friends and chosen family, but she wanted to meet the parents. I explained my past with my stepmother and her tendencies. She understood and stopped asking. Well, long story short, for another post, my stepmother showed up one day i live 150 miles away and invited us in person for dinner i felt obligated to go when my girlfriend and i arrived the night went as normal as possible but then my girlfriend brought up the picture of my ex and i it's a good picture where was that at enter my stepmother she rambled on about how happy we were together and how she me was so much more fit back then and it's a shame things didn't work out for him It was unbearable. I interrupted and said it's late. We have to go. My girlfriend and I gathered our things. Oh, she always gets so upset about it. It's a part of your past. You need to accept that, my stepmom said as we were packing up. And I'm a different person now. You live in the past. You have to expect that. Not my best line, but I was upset. My girlfriend and I broke up for her to study in another state. And every girl I date now, I'm scared to bring over. It's such an awkward, unbearable, and embarrassing thing to do to your stepdaughter. My dad won't help either. He never gets involved with the topic of removing it. I hate that I can't convince her, and I hate that she rubs it in my face. 
I wish that picture would just disappear. Yeah, this one just sucks, but realistically, there is actually nothing you can do. You've tried your best already. Nothing's changed. Ultimately, I reckon just trust in your future partners and just say, look, I don't have a good relationship with my stepmom because she has this weird obsession with my ex. Simple as that. And if you've chosen your partner well and, you know, you have a good relationship, then they should be like, well, that's a shame, but okay, I understand. We're not going to go and see her at her house. If you want to go one step further, say it's a deal breaker. You can't see me if you have that in your house. And say the same to your dad as well. I don't know why your dad is not sticking up for you. It's a ridiculous thing to do in the first place. Simple as that. You keep that picture up, I'm never going to see you again. There you go. See how much I love the picture after you say that to them. My mother threw the biggest fit when I wouldn't name my child what she wanted me to. Hi Reddit. Got another story about my mum to share. This one happened about 14 years ago now. I, then a 21 year old male, and my wife, then a 22 year old, were happy to announce that we were expecting our first child. We've been trying for a while and have been told by the wife's doctor that she had some complications that would make it very difficult for her to conceive. I don't remember what the issue was, but it wasn't impossible, just difficult. We'd basically given up on trying. We were just enjoying our lives together and having the back burner hope that it might happen one day. And it did. We were both overjoyed and terrified. Nothing is as real as finding out you're expecting child number one, and it can be a lot to take in at once. Everyone's excited. Congrats all around. My parents' first grandchild, etc. My dad was probably the most wholesome I'd ever seen or heard him when we told him the news. My mum was over the moon too, at first. After the first couple of months, we started really trying to hunt down names. We'd already considered and rejected the idea of naming our son after really any family member. We just weren't interested in that. We both subscribed to the idea that the sound of a name is important. Your name is the very first impression people will have of you before even looking in your eyes. They can already have an opinion of you and we wanted it to be a good one. I won't give details of what name we chose or what names we rejected. I'm not trying to bash on anyone's name and I think now the actions are much more important than how a name sounds. When we told the families what we had decided to name him, one person took umbrage with our choice. Of course, my mum. According to my mother, at least one person in each generation needs to have the name. It's the family name. She practically wailed at me when I wouldn't budge. It's the same name I gave you. For the record, I do not like my first name and I'm never called by it. I'm mostly called by nicknames or my last name, never my first. I don't hate it. I just don't feel like it suits me or my personality. It's not a silly or archaic name, just not for me. It turned into quite a thing. I can't really remember all that she said, but suffice to say, we were the biggest traitors to the family and we were tearing down tradition. She blamed my wife, saying that she'd brainwashed me into it and all that. I was the one that came up with the name we wound up going with for him. Well, I talked to my grandma and she said that the name wasn't really the name. It was her husband's name and she named one of her sons the same. My mum named me with it and decided it was tradition. We had several months of no contact after that because frankly, we didn't want to deal with her BS. Hang on, so you're telling me this entire tradition about the name isn't even a tradition at all. Your mum's just made it up. What actually is she doing? I mean, telling someone what to name their child in the first place is pretty strange, but saying it's because of some weird tradition that isn't a tradition at all and it's all made up is even weirder. Also, isn't that just the point of a surname? Isn't that literally the point of it, to carry on your family's tradition? Why do you need to have the first name as well? I mean, isn't that what middle names are for as well? If you really want to use someone else's name as well as the surname, then you can put their first name as your middle name, as your child's middle name. Having the same first name as your dad and their dad or whatever, however it works in any family, is a bit weird. Um, Let me know in the comments if you are one of those people. But my son needs to watch Bluey. Last night, when I went to sign in to open Netflix, I found that my TV had been signed out. Went to sign back in and I couldn't do it. It had been about a year since I last signed in, so I assumed I just forgot my password and requested to reset it. When I went to my email, I saw an email from Netflix this morning saying my password had been successfully changed. Obviously a red flag, so I went through all of our subscription services and updated passwords and changed my email password just in case. I got a call from my brother's ex-wife, let's call her Kate, about an hour ago. They've been divorced over four years now asking me why i changed my password i didn't realize that she still had my account info i was a bit annoyed and i told her that someone had changed the password on me and that i didn't feel comfortable giving out my account info especially not to someone i was not in contact with Jumping back a bit, my in-laws are staying at our home and at night after everyone goes to bed, I guess we have four devices in our home running our Netflix account simultaneously. When she called, Kate explained how she tried to get onto our account on Christmas night and was greeted with the message that there were too many users on our account currently so she could not access it. She got the idea that it would be totally fine with me if she logged into our Netflix account and changed the password so that her and her new husband could watch their show. She said this calmly like it was the most reasonable thing in the world. I 
I nearly lost it. I've got no idea how anyone would think it would be okay to change someone else's password because you are too cheap to pay for it yourself. I told her I don't want to hear from her anymore. I'm not giving her our info and I hung up. 15 minutes ago, she called my wife and asked for the Disney Plus password. I was lazy and had the same account info for each streaming service, and apparently she figured this out and was logged into several of our services. When I realized who my wife was talking to and what about, I motioned for the phone. Kate was just whining that she at least needed to have access to Disney Plus so her son, who is 18 months old, could watch Bluey and that he just needed it to be able to get ready for bed. I told her to F off and hung up. Great way to ruin my mood for the night. Wow, as if using someone else's Netflix account and Disney account and whatever else accounts was bad enough. It's that she doesn't realize that she's in the wrong. Like, she doesn't even apologize. She's just like, yeah, I thought I would change the password because I wanted to watch. What's the big deal? I don't care. We needed to watch on Christmas Eve. Oh, my son needs to watch Bluey. Why are you complaining? It's so weird. The good news is that at least now you know, but in theory, she's been stealing money from you for quite a while now. I mean, how long ago was she with your ex? Four years? So maybe for four years, she's been using your Netflix account. That is quite a lot of money. How much is Netflix these days? $15 or so? $15 times four, $60 times 12 monthly cost. What's that? $720? quite a lot in it. A strange father and his fourth wife told my fiance she should be grateful for the chance to reconnect with her abusive mother. My fiance grew up in a very abusive household. Her mother was emotionally, physically, and verbally abusive to her. A key example, she snuck laxatives into my fiance's food as a child whenever she felt that her daughter was getting too pudgy. She also forced my fiance to stay inside the house for an entire year as a child with no outside social connection what we are visiting my family for the holidays out of states i'm not close to my father as he basically walked out when i was 10 however i've tried to reconnect and be civil over the years so i see him once a year or so around the holidays we agreed to have dinner with him and his fourth wife who he married well into my adulthood on christmas eve big mistake my father's wife started asking my fiance about her family to which my fiance said that she is not close with them and other than one dinner we had with them a few months ago it was by nature of a complex situation not a desire to see them she hasn't seen her parents in four to five years i've previously told my father and his wife on more than one occasion that her parents were abusive and she does not see them his wife though doubles down saying how it must have been nice to reconnect and that it's nice that i got to meet them my father made a couple of similar comments as well as calling my fiance his daughter to be and referring to her as the daughter his fourth wife never had my fiance excused herself and went to the bathroom to cry my father's wife then tells me it's really nice you got to meet her parents i told them not really they abused the woman who's going to be my wife and caused her immense pain i could have gone a lifetime without meeting them but i will always be there to support her this is a very sensitive subject and we would prefer not to talk about it my father then chimes in with well i'm sure we'll meet them at the wedding no you won't father not only because her parents are not invited to the wedding but because you've demonstrated a complete lack of respect for our boundaries have been oblivious to the pain your wife is causing my wife to be and are actively causing my fiance emotional pain your wife is now uninvited and you very likely are as well i mean what is it with this episode and parents just not understanding at all what is going on like where's the common sense here you've literally been told multiple times i assume by your son my fiance doesn't have the best relationship with her mum for these reasons that wow shock are pretty obvious how can you forget something like that or maybe they actually haven't forgotten and they're just doing it for the sake of it i don't know either way it's very malicious first of all you should never forget something like that when told about your own son and his fiance and then bringing it up again to her face how dumb are you it's also weird that they're very pushy about her parents anyway like i feel like at that point they must know they must remember because they seem to bring up her parents so much in the first place like more than you would about someone else's parents anyway it's just weird your father's wife saying it's really nice you got to meet her parents to you once your fiance has already left the room it's just it's just weird something malicious is definitely going on here all i will say is that i have seen stories on this subreddit before that i've covered on my channel about estranged parents being invited to weddings by the other side's parents who've managed to get in contact with them so whatever you do op do not give your dad or his new wife any sort of inclination into how to get in contact with your fiance's estranged parents because that could literally be catastrophic is my mother-in-law stalking us recently my husband and i moved out of the states since we do have a very bad history with my mother-in-law ever since we got married she's caused a lot of trouble to my husband and i we decided not to tell her directly because we didn't want her to cause any negativity during our move we did tell my sister-in-laws and obviously we knew they would tell her we didn't share any time or date of our move 
Since then, my mother-in-law knew but didn't say a single word to us about our move which I found extremely concerning because she's not the type of person to stay silent. My husband and I finally just moved to our new apartment and not a single word was said to any of his family members about our moving date. We didn't even spend a full day in our apartment when my mother-in-law texted me saying things like, have you settled into the new place? You guys must feel very tired and asking me if I liked our new place, being fake nice to my face like always. She then sends my husband a whole paragraph about how she's gonna be lonely and how it's a test from God and indirectly guilt tripping my husband a lot. She completely made our move about herself. My husband decided not to respond. And so she double texts him, asking him to respond so she knows you're okay. He proceeds to let her know that if we don't respond, it means we're busy because we're still in the process of moving in. What concerned me is how did she know? Where did she find out? Next example, we didn't share with anyone that we are sick, but fast forward to today, my mother-in-law randomly texted my husband saying, if you feel sick, dull, down, etc., make sure to take vitamin D. Your body needs vitamin D. And it seemed as if she knew he was sick. A while back, my mother-in-law used to have my husband's location. He wasn't aware of it. So he stopped sharing it and she went insane on him and said really emotionally incestuous things like, hope I can forget about you. I wish I could stop loving you. You left me. You're just like your dad. So there's no doubt that she wouldn't go crazy that we move states. How can we find out if she's stalking us and how should we proceed? A little letter as well. She is currently out of the country while doing all of this. So there's no way she could have watched us move or anything of that sort. My husband also said he's not sharing any passwords or isn't logged into any devices. We also haven't told a single person when we're moving. The only thing my husband shares with her is a joint bank account, which only he has access to, but she doesn't have any access at all. He made sure of it. We've not told anyone when we're moving. Now, from my point of view, there is no real way that you can work out from her past actions if you're being stalked or not or how she's doing it. So what I would suggest is the only way you can know is doing stuff in the future make up something that's what you got to do make up a huge story for example talk about your pregnant wife or something she isn't pregnant but you're gonna lie about it and then you're gonna see if your mother-in-law brings it up with you over text or whatever and then you'll know for sure right because a big thing like that she's gonna bring it up if she knows about it i mean she's brought up the fact that you're ill i don't know how she knows that but you're never gonna know make up that your fiance is pregnant speak about it text each other about it i don't know do what you want to do set up some weird experiment and then see if she says anything again what i will say i don't know what it is with this episode and mothers stalking and just being weird this is entitled parents but still this is a special episode clearly it's extremely extremely strange so needy oh i don't know just looking through the comments here people are saying that she might have installed some sort of tracking software on either of your phones back up your contacts and do a factory reset is that something you could do i don't know it's very very odd like how can she know all this stuff and it's also a lot of different information like yeah she could have got some of it from people the fact that you're moving but the dates the fact that you're ill i mean I, I don't know maybe she's got multiple tracking things and just i don't know fly monkeys that feed her information could be anything whatever it is you need to figure it out quickly so yes Start that rumor, say you're pregnant, and see if she cottons on. So you get two New Year's Eve celebrations, and I get none? I am a bartender. Obviously, when you sign up to be one, you have to commit to busy periods. Christmas, New Year's Eve, Halloween, etc. I don't mind working these. I was roasted on to work New Year's Eve, and whilst I did enjoy the shift, I couldn't exactly celebrate the new year. However, in my city, there's a bar that does a bartender's ball on the 1st of January every year. So all bartenders that work New Year's Eve can have their own celebration. Do a fake countdown at midnight, get drunk, etc. I was going to attend the bartender's ball, seeing as I didn't get New Year's Eve off. But I was roted on an early shift today. I figured there's no point in me going if I can't drink and have to be home by 2 a.m. So I looked at swapping my shift. One of my co-workers said she's happy to swap with me. She was off for New Year's Eve, meaning she's already celebrated and I can have my own celebration. It's a win-win. We both get to party in our own way. She tells me over and over that she's happy to swap, but when it comes time to swap the shift, suddenly she can't do it because she needs to take care of her child. Okay, I wouldn't mind that if it were true. I don't get to enjoy New Year's Eve, and now nor do I go to Bartender's Ball. But she does. She has New Year's Eve off, and she decides to attend Bartender's Ball rather than going home to her child like she planned. She comes into work today and has the nerve to try and talk to me about it. You should have come. 
Yeah, well, I would have if you actually went home to your child and swapped the shift with me. I get that I'm not entitled to a shift swap, but don't use the I need to take care of my child card and then not take care of them. No idea what happened to the kid. She was probably dumped on her grandmother like she always is. I'm just fuming that my coworker got two New Year's Eve celebrations and I got nothing. Now, this is just inherently selfish. I mean, come on. This is absolutely ridiculous. So entitled. I agree. If genuinely she had to go and sort out her child and that was the reason why she could no longer, you know, swap her shifts with you and she was apologetic about it, I would say it's a shame, but it happens. But the fact that she's lying about it, I can't get behind that. It's an absolute disgrace. You have to go and talk to your manager and make sure this cannot happen again because this is so unfair. She gets two of the biggest nights of the year off. One that is maybe the biggest night apart from Christmas Day and another that's a massive night for you and bartenders across the country and maybe the world, I don't know. And you get nothing? That is criminal. My mother's behavior towards mine and my girlfriend's baby on the way i'm seriously struggling at the minute me and my girlfriend have a baby on the way with not much time to go now before he's due this will be mum's first grandchild and i appreciate she's super excited but she's being too controlling and overprotective quite early on she was just bombarding us with names that either myself or girlfriend didn't like she took offense to it and started accusing my girlfriend of being too fussy and controlling slash not giving me a choice for me a lot of these names were associated with people i've met in my life and had bad experiences with and my girlfriend works in a nursery and had seen many kids over the years with most of the names who've been either dirty not looked after properly or really naughty children that she didn't want to associate with naming her child which i'm completely with she eventually calmed this down until recently i had a christmas present for my girlfriend delivered to my mum's as nobody would be in at my home she decided to wrap it and write a label on it as being from bump which I politely asked her not to do as I didn't like it. I said it's a nice thought, but it's different next year when he's born, but not whilst he's still cooking away. Mum threw a big strop over it, accused me of being selfish and ungrateful. All the names under the sun, basically. And for what? Me saying I didn't like a Christmas tech? Then over the Christmas period, we've both agreed on a name that we both really like. Mum's decided she hates it though, and has since bombarding us with new name suggestions, trying to deter us away from it. I don't know if this post makes me sound petty, but it's becoming so stressful for me and my girlfriend. It's our baby, and my mum's behaving like it's hers. She wants to pick the name. It's everyone's fault if we don't like the name she suggests. World War Three for liking a name she doesn't. Both my grandma and stepdad even think she's being controlling and acting like the baby is hers. But if either say anything to her, she'll just shut them both down and kick off. My grandma fears for the baby's safety in my mum's hands. She just seems really unstable. My grandma has dementia and mum won't even care for her or visit unless my stepdad forces her to. Her number one focus is baby and it's getting too much. She's behaving stupidly entitled. Yeah, I think the most telling thing here is that your own grandmother is saying these things about her daughter, saying that she doesn't think that your child is gonna be safe in your mum's hands. That is potentially the biggest red flag I've ever seen with any grandmother to be scary and also this post is not petty at all if it's becoming that stressful for you and your girlfriend that you're this worried you're posting on reddit your grandma is saying these things about your own mother that's a terrifying spot to be in and yeah you need to do something about it or at least put some measures in place to make sure that your mum can have no more influence than she's already had entitled brother-in-law hates me but also thinks i'm going to get him a fancy job or a promotion my significant other's brother is trying to reconcile with his family after years of estrangement the reasons behind it are irrelevant to this story and and the explanation is too long to write out. For purposes of this post, let's just say that there was an innocent misunderstanding that caused a bad reaction from both my brother-in-law and the family. But my brother-in-law was ultimately to blame for the whole thing and had the very worst reaction possible. He admits that he was wrong and the family owns their mistakes that are much more understandable and well-intentioned in my opinion. Everyone has apologized sincerely and they're working on the relationship. Each family member had been texting and later calling him. I only met him once briefly before the big blow up so we didn't have a relationship relationship. He was invited to Christmas, which both my SO and I were worried about, but we still went to his aunt's house. Everything went well between my brother-in-law and the family, and I was so relieved and happy to see that. His wife and stepkids were very nice and seemed much more comfortable with us than him. Everyone liked them right away. The only problem is that he hates me. We work in the same industry, but I'm several rungs above him and five years younger. He asked around about me after he found out what I do, and it turns out that I used to be my brother-in-law's current boss's boss a few years ago. The thing is that I have a natural ability, for which I take no credit since I'm simply lucky enough to have been born with it, 
that makes my job much easier. There are only a few of us in our industry. He has to work harder for the same result. It's not fair, but it's also not my fault. This man spent three hours looking at me like I just killed his family. My SO says he's insanely competitive and absolutely seething because he can't really say much to me without coming off like the jerk he really is. I probably make double his salary, which annoys him as well. My SO isn't optimistic about this reconciliation and is worried that my brother-in-law will hurt his mum and aunt again. He's convinced that he's going to crawl back because they're both in their 90s now and he's hoping for an inheritance. We bought his mum's house and there isn't much else to inherit. I don't know my brother-in-law well enough myself to determine if he's actually that type of person, but I've also got no reason to doubt my significant other. My brother-in-law told my significant other that he wanted me to get him hired with one of my clients or recommend to his boss that he get a promotion and a raise. My SO told him to ask me himself, but according to him, my brother-in-law never would because that would be admitting that he needs my help and that he's beneath me. He would have to show me his work, which would be demeaning apparently. Let's hope he's right. I'm happy to have a hi, how are you? Nice weather we're having. Bye type of relationship because he's my SO's brother, but I'm not sticking my neck out for this jerk. Obviously, I will never say one word about work in his presence. Here's to hopefully seeing very little of him in 2023. Yeah, no real surprises here. Of course, your brother-in-law who hates you wants to get a promotion through you that he hasn't earned and has no real right to even ask you for in the first place. Doesn't really surprise me at all. That is literally the epitome of this subreddit. I mean, this opinion of mine is just compounded by the fact that he's only coming back into your family's lives when he thinks that someone might die and he wants a little bit of money. If that doesn't just show how entitled he is, I don't know what does. Give me your property you don't need it right now and the unexpected mvps i thought stores would be closed off or working much shorter hours during the holidays once i got to the store i saw that i was sadly for the people working there mostly wrong but that meant i would not need to buy as much as i initially thought i brought with me three reusable shopping bags but i ended up needing just one while i can't say i have an emotional attachment to their bags i do like them very much I bought them because I love the design, color, and print on them and gave a bit more money than one would buying reusable shopping bags in the grocery store. They're nice, practical, and I like them. I finished loading my stuff onto the conveyor belt at the cash register and put the separator so that the person behind me does not waste time but start uploading their haul. Last, I put my three bags on top of my stuff because I had them in the shopping cart while I was picking stuff up. While I'm fishing out my wallet from my purse, I catch a flash of color in my periphery. I look up and see the woman behind me reach over and take two of my bags. Confused, I stutter. Excuse me, those are not store bags. Those are my own property. Please give them back to me. I know these are not the store ones. I'm not an idiot. This store has red bags with their logo on them. Then why are you taking my property? You don't need all of them. Your groceries will fit nicely into just that one. I need these. Mind your own business and stop making a scene. Now I'm confused and getting irritated. I'm making a scene for confronting her politely about taking my stuff. But before I can even react, the older gentleman who was a customer before me in the line and has just finished paying his bill, as well as the cashier, round on this woman. You will give her back her property or I will have the security escort you out, says the cashier. How dare you behave as you are the one being inconvenienced. You take this girl's property and tell her she doesn't need it and should not resist you. If you need reusable bags, just buy them for yourself, says the man. The woman starts huffing and puffing. Now, wait just a minute. Why are you all making such a scene? The cashier all but yells. Now, I'm not negotiating or listening to you. Taking the property of others is stealing, no matter how you try and reason it. The cashier then picks up a mic and calls security to the register and looks at the entitled woman sternly. So, what will it be? The woman gives me back my bags while mumbling something about, it's just a few worthless bags. I thank the cashier and the old man and go on my merry way. I didn't do much but stand my ground, but the cashier and the old man were the MVPs. It did warm my heart that people saw something nasty and immediately jumped in to correct the foul behavior. Happy holidays, everyone. A classic entitled parents story here, one that we've seen an iteration of many, many times. I just don't know what possesses these people. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Why? Why take someone else's stuff? Why do you need their bags in the first place? Just, if anything, buy your own ages ago. Or if not, just get them on the day. It's so weird. Like, for me, reading this is something that I would never, ever consider doing. Like, you would never even go to that length in your own mind. Like, your own inner monologue wouldn't go, Ah, I wish I could steal her bags. Like, it just makes no sense to me. Some things are so outlandish that I would never understand. But that is entitled people. A crazy Karen followed me home. 
So this happened a few years ago for some context I was a 22 year old female though I do have a baby face and could pass for 16 17 years old easily I had a Yamaha motorbike 125 cc meaning it could easily go 70 miles an hour My dad raced motocross and i've been riding bikes my whole life He taught me all the road rules and safety do's and don'ts So one day i'm riding to visit my uncle who lived in the middle of nowhere And the roads there are all 50 miles an hour and have extreme bends and on each side of the road is a massive ditch I'm going 55 miles an hour, only slowing when the bends are bad. Cue a Karen with three kids, all under 10, in the back, tailing me. And I mean tailing within a couple of feet to the back of my bike. I speed up to ignore her, and she pulls her minivan to the side of me and tries to force me to the edge of the road, which is just a ditch. I slow and let her pass, my heart racing as I barely kept my bike upright. You think this is where it ends, right? Nope. I was maybe a few miles from my uncle's at this point and I have to go through a village high street to get there As i'm going through I see karen her minivan is blocking the street and she stood with her door open in the road Her arms out as she tries to stop me and force me off I just managed to get past her as onlookers were yelling at her to stop I go the last few streets of my uncle's and stop down the road parking my bike and taking my helmet off With a screech karen's minivan pulls up in front of me and she runs for me screaming What the frick is wrong with you? You don't know how to drive When I just stare at her, she screeches again. Only cars can drive in the road. Bikes have to drive on the side or pavement. Yeah, nope, that's so wrong. That thing can't go fast enough to be on the road. You should have pulled over when I told you to. I'm going to report you. At this point, I see my uncle coming outside, his eyes shifting between the Karen and me. Now, something to know about my uncle and me is that we are crazy close, both pranksters. Also, my uncle is six foot and not a small man. So, without skipping a beat, I put on a fake sad face and run to him, screaming in a terrified voice. Daddy, this lady tried to grab me off my bike and followed me home. Now, where I live, you can get a provisional license before 18, meaning that I could have been a minor. Try not to laugh. My uncle puffs up his chest and yells out at the woman who had run after me and was now behind us. You followed my little girl home? She's a child. Karen's face went white as she tried to defend herself, only for my uncle to interrupt her. As loud as he could, making sure every nosy neighbor had come out, he screams, What are you? Some kind of pervert? I'm calling the police. Without blinking, Karen runs for her car, speeding off with three confused looking kids in the back. As soon as Karen was out of view, I told my uncle what happened and we both laughed as we went inside to see my aunt laughing as she'd watched the whole thing through the window. And there we go, saving the most crazy entitled people story for last. I don't really know what I've just read. All I have is the image of this Karen with her car door open, her hands out wide standing next to it, trying to stop a 125cc motorbike. How dumb can you be? If anything, uh, if it wasn't illegal, I'd say just drive into her and see what happens then. See if she's still entitled after that. I mean, yeah, a little bit dark, but what's she going to do about it? She is the one that's standing in the middle of the road trying to stop oncoming traffic. She deserves it. Entitled aunt tries to grab me, so I push her into the pool. A quick bit of background. I am a 17-year-old trans male, and I live in a rural part of Quebec with my mothers and sisters. So... This happened last week and I wanted to post it here. I've gotten my COVID vaccine yesterday and my arm was very sore from it and it hurt when someone touched it. Saturday was my cousin's birthday. Keep in mind that he's 10. My aunt, our entitled parent of this story, wanted everything to be perfect for her son. My mother and I were invited and had no choice but to follow. Now, something you should know is that my aunt is homophobic, transphobic, religious, and an overall nasty woman. Okay, so we arrived at the party. It was a hot summer's day, so it was a pool party. The party was gorgeous. Beautiful decorations, cake, and snacks. When my aunt notices us and comes to see my mother and I, it was clear she didn't recognize me at first. Oh, who's this? My mum said, this is OP, but we call him by his new name now. My entitled aunt looked disgusted at the fact that I was no longer a girl. She made a nasty remark about my clothes and hair. I was polite and said I was glad to see her, which I wasn't, and went to see my other cousin. We'll call him Ginger, who's the same age as me and not at all like his mother. Later, at around three o'clock, the party's going fine and everything is okay. I can tell my aunt has been staring at me in disgust, but I just brush it off. I was sitting by the pool watching the kids play when I heard that dreaded, excuse me, OP. I look behind me and see my aunt standing over me. Hey aunt, do you need anything? Yes, I want you to put this dress on and stop distracting the kids, she said. 
as she handed me a tacky pink dress. Uh, sorry, aunt, but I'm not gonna do that, I replied, as I put the dress on the nearby chairs. But OP, you really shouldn't be out dressed like that in front of the children. Keep in mind, I was wearing shorts that stopped at my knees and a t-shirt. No, aunt, I don't have to listen to you, I said, trying to go find my mum. Remember when I said my arm hurt a lot because of my vaccine? Well, my aunt grabs right where I was vaccinated and squeezes. I yelp in pain, screaming for her to let go. She doesn't and keeps yelling how I'm a sin and that I'm going to hell for this. I eventually free my arm and push out of reflex. She stumbles back into the pool and falls in, dressed and makeup on. She comes up and yells at me that I'm a monster and that I am damned for hell. My mum comes over having seen the whole thing and tells my aunt that we're leaving. According to Ginger, after we left, my aunt sulked the whole party and said I ruined her day. Keep in mind, it was her child's birthday party and not hers. So just to make this clear, OP, you're telling me you pushed your transphobic and homophobic aunt into a pool. Sorry, what a legend, by the way. Well done, this guy. Doing the right thing, doing something that I can only dream of doing, which is, um, you know, giving someone a little bit of karma that deserves it. Well done. So then, moving on to the second story of today's episode, Karen cancels order because she didn't believe shrimp was a meat. This is from when I worked at a tiny pickup delivery restaurant in an affluent area by a major university and hospital. Most customers were from surrounding neighborhoods or drunk high uni students and stressed out nurses. This was my second job, but the first one where I had to deal with customers face to face. I was given no training, so it was a bit of a learning curve. Enter Boomer Karen, who looked like she was born with not just a chip, but a whole block on both shoulders. She waddled in on a fine afternoon and ordered one of our more popular items, fried rice. Our fried rice had the option to add a meat for $1 more. Karen specifically wanted shrimp fried rice. All right, madam, that'll be $6.66. I don't actually remember the price. The Karen was aghast. What? Uh, But the menu says $5.66. Yes, madam, but meat costs $1 extra. Her face then filled with pure disbelief and contempt, lip curling up in growing outrage. Then she ground out in a near hiss, shrimp is a meat? I was shocked at the ridiculous question, also thinking that it's clearly listed under meats on the menu, and oh my Garados, what do I do? Me.exe has stopped functioning. Um, yes, madam, meat is when you partake of a living creature's flesh, and it used to be a little animal swimming around in the ocean. I wiggled my hand then to emphasize without thinking, because now my brain is broken. What the what just happened to you, OP? What the heck? <laughs> Karen's eyes now grew big with indignation. I brace for yelling. I have enough entitled relatives to recognize the signs. Why am I here alone? This sucks. Karen then snorted like an angry bull. I'm surprised she didn't slam a fist on the counter. It looked like she wanted to, but she was holding a clutch purse. How dare you? This is a scam. Shrimp isn't a meat. This is a ripoff. She then ranted for a bit more. I started chewing her out at this point since she wasn't anything close to as scary as my mum when she gets angry. I then see her take a breath and get a word in. Do you want to order the shrimp fried rice, madam, or perhaps a regular one? Oh, cancel it. She then stormed out through the thankfully propped open door. It was a glass door and would have broken from a good slam. Uh, okay then, I just said to myself. Fortunately, she never returned, and the shift manager, when he returned from a delivery, thought it was hilarious. Uh, yes, Karen, I can confirm, shrimp is a meat. I I thought that was pretty obvious, you know, fish is meat, crab is meat, shrimp's meat, um, anything that tastes kind of meaty is normally a meat. It's crazy, but, um, yeah, that's just how the world works. I I didn't know people didn't realize that that shrimp was a meat, uh, and even so, why are you complaining so much and getting into such a fit about a one dollar extra payment? Hey, six dollars or whatever the price was, seems pretty reasonable for shrimp fried rice. I'd pay for that right now, and by the way i'm actually quite hungry and um the more i think about shrimp fried rice the more i think i kind of want to go and get some food but hey six dollars for that pretty great price i don't know why karen was you know 
getting so mad. It's just a little bit of money for some food. And now moving on to our final story of today's episode. Entitled professor yells at me when I won't let her student into my bar without ID. I am a 21 year old female and I work at an upscale restaurant bar as an events social media coordinator and occasional host. I truly love my job and my managers and everything. My restaurant is in a large college town where I also attend. And so we have a large demographic of people coming in. This happened a few weeks ago while I was working as a host that night. And as we are a bar as well, I check IDs and I'm technically considered a bouncer, which is funny because I'm literally 125 pounds. I also usually have an actual big bouncer with me who comes up from one of our sister bars to help me out with IDs and stuff. But today I didn't. So an entitled parent comes in. Now she looks to be in her 60s with her students who looks to be in her early 20s. So I definitely was going to have to card her. Also under my state's laws, I can only accept the following forms of ID, either US state ID or license, US military ID or passports of any country. Now this does not include foreign IDs or licenses. It must be a passport. So here is how the conversation goes. Hi, welcome to the restaurant. How are you doing today? Hi, said the entitled parents. This is my PhD students from such and such country and we just wanted to get a drink. Now, a little note, I didn't ask for this info. She literally just told me right off the bat. This is the only reason why I'm mentioning it. Okay, great. Can I see your ID, I say, looking at the students? She looks a little concerned and goes, I didn't bring an ID. Oh, I'm sorry, but the only way I can allow you to drink is for you to present a valid ID. The entitled professor immediately gets defensive and loud and goes, I've known this girl for four years and she is over 21. Again, I'm sorry, but I do need a valid form of ID. I list all of our valid forms then, which is also posted on a sign near the entrance of the restaurants. She is of age and I know it. I can vouch for her. I do have my undergrad graduate student ID with me. She begins to take out her undergrad student ID. Now she's not from my school, but that doesn't matter at all. And I again tell them that I need a valid form of ID. She then tries to hand me the school ID that has her birthday in the bottom corner, which does say that she is over 21. But again, I cannot accept this. See, her ID shows that she's over 21. I start going on my spiel again, but this woman is not having it. Apparently, a school ID is just as legit as a government-issued document to her. But whatever, what do I know? It's not like I check IDs for seven hours of my shift or anything. The entitled professor is pretty much yelling at me and causing a whole scene in the entrance area at this point. This is ridiculous. She has shown more than enough to gain entry. I know her very well and I know she's of age. She's a PhD student here and we deserve to be served. Mom, I'm sorry about that, but this is the law. I could get into serious trouble, not just with my boss, but with the authorities by allowing someone to be served without a valid ID. I cannot believe this. We're leaving. She turns to leave. And as she's exiting, she turns back to me and says the most bizarre thing. Oh, and by the way, that is an accredited university. She's referring to the student ID. I was honestly just like so confused by the whole situation that I don't even say anything back. Again, I would like to reiterate that from the beginning, this woman was hostile and extremely rude. She continuously raised her voice throughout the interaction while I stayed extremely calm and was as professional as I could be. And just to let you guys know how hostile she was, there was a group of three that entered right behind her, waiting to get ID'd and seated, and they'd listened to the whole interaction. Now, as soon as the woman left, they asked me, Are you okay? That lady was so awful. So yeah, I told my boss who also owns the place and he was very proud of me for standing my ground. 
I love you, King Julian. Well then, not entirely sure if OP's boss is called Julian or she's just a massive Madagascar fan. But either way, King Julian, you are the GOAT. Now, as for the story, I can actually kind of relate to the student. I was a student for a long time and it would be very annoying when, you know, you'd forget your ID on a night out, but you'd have your student card with you, which said your date of birth and therefore your age. And, you know, said you were over 21 or over 18 in the, in the UK. But still, like, as soon as you learn that it's not a valid form of ID, which everyone one does you know it's just like yeah you're not gonna get into places if they're asking for ids and you just have your student id it's not valid sorry it's not a legally binding document that the government has said yes that is a good form of id to let you into places and you have to you have to you know think about the bar's perspective if they do let you in without id and then later you know it gets found out that you are under 18 or under 21 in america in this story they can be liable for massive you know lawsuits damages police stuff they don't want to be risking that that is for sure and yeah a student id is not a valid form of id so there you go stop complaining go home get your id and come back well uh, that's what i used to do when i forgot my id at uni anyway um but that is probably what this person should have done he can't play guitar he's faking it I've been browsing this subreddit for a few days now and decided I get my fair share of entitlements. I'm 14 years old and live in the Netherlands. My father is Dutch and my mum is Vietnamese. I've been playing guitar for over five years and I really enjoy doing it. My dad listened to a lot of dream theatre and I grew up with that. I play a lot of progressive metal. This happened last year before COVID came. I was almost 14. We had this talent show in the second grade of middle school and I decided to join. I played The Endless Knot by Haken, a great song, with a little improvised solo in the silent piano part near the end. There were no real awards, but it was mostly for enjoyment. There were like 10 other participants. Six of them were girls that sung, one group that danced, two comedians and one other guitarist. And I won. I was really happy and the other participants were really nice. I personally found one comedian hilarious. He had some good jokes. A lot of parents actually gave me a standing ovation and it was one of the best moments of my life. Unfortunately, my parents weren't there because of work. One of the girls that sung was crying that she didn't win and her mum, the entitled mum of this story, came to comfort her. I didn't get a reward and the talent show was just for entertainment and fun. But this entitled mum was so mad that her daughter didn't win. She went to the jury and said that I'd faked my guitar playing, although I practiced a lot for it. I got on the stage and she followed me. She started accusing me of faking it in front of everyone. At first, I thought she knew the song and that it's being played on a seven string guitar. I use an Epiphany Les Paul with single coils and six strings. I played the lower parts just one octave higher and it sounded fine, but she never said anything about that. She also said that a guitar could never make such sounds and I explained that it was plugged into an amplifier with my self-made pedal board. After that came this ridiculous conversation. How dare you make my daughter cry with that faking of yours? The entire mum said. Mom, I didn't fake my playing. But a kid like you could never play something like that. There's no explanation. You're faking. Obviously, she didn't have any real arguments. Why would I participate in a talent show without an award and fake something? After that, she went a little quiet. Then she said, then prove that you're not faking it. So I played a few ladders at high speed and the solo of the song without the backing track. At this point, the audience was agreeing with me and they told the woman to please leave the stage. After that, she got onto the whole Satanism thing. Now I was wearing a tool shirt with a kind of graphic back and here is a picture of it. Okay, so as you can see, um, I mean, they're not that, are they, are they satanic? I wouldn't know they were. Yeah, the design on the back is a little weird, I guess, but I wouldn't say it's satanic. And even if it is, who cares? Well, apparently this entitled mum, who said, because you're a Satanist. Uh, what? I don't understand how this is relevant in any way, by the way, guys. Yeah, I see that shirt. It's pure blasphemy. It's a banned shirt. They aren't even satanic. I don't believe it. You're going to manipulate us all with that devilish music of yours. I'm not manipulating anyone. I'm just doing this for fun. F off you, insert racist Asian slur that I don't want to translate. Go back to your devilish worships. Now I'm getting really annoyed at this point. I'm not a Satanist and also don't call me that. But the entitled mum just says the same racist Asian slur again to me. 
The judges then asked her to please leave the stage. The daughter tried to stop her mother, but the entitled mum kept going. The daughter got really embarrassed and ran away. The entitled mum looked at me and said, look what you've done. She then approached me and tried to punch me, but I just pushed her away and people began to actually drag her away from me. While she was dragged, she was screaming even more racist Asian slurs. She was ultimately banned from the school and I never heard of her again. The daughter eventually confronted me at school and apologized. I accepted the apology and we became friends. I went to her house a few times actually, but I never saw her mum. I never actually asked what happened because I didn't even want to think about her anymore. And that was my story of an entitled parent. Thanks for listening. Well, uh, yeah, uh, a classic case here of a parent getting jealous because someone else's kid is more talented than theirs. Seen it all before, pretty standard stuff, but um, yeah, I, I guess it does happen a lot, that's for sure. To be fair, this parent might actually genuinely be a little bit embarrassed and jealous of this kid because they're young, right? 14 is not old and to be that talented at that age is very impressive. Honestly, I reckon the parent is looking at the kid going, I have never been that talented at any musical instruments in, in my entire life, yet this guy is 14 and is just absolutely dominating and has won the talent show for, for being incredible. I'm going to make them feel bad about themselves because that is what I want to do. Strange. And now moving on to our next story. You can't fire me. I have kids. This was many years ago when I was the shop steward for a union. This means I was the one who had to mediate grievances between employees and management. So, the manager calls me to discuss an issue with an employee he wanted to fire. He had done progressive discipline, had given her many chances, and now was just done. The issue was, the woman just didn't want to show up for work. He told me how many chances he had given her, and he wanted me present for her termination notice. That termination notice went like this. The manager said, Entitled worker, do you know why I asked for this meeting and why I asked the shop steward to be present, OP? No, I have no idea. Well, you were supposed to work yesterday from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And that was written on the schedule, correct? Yes, but I overslept. Yes, and when you didn't show up for work, I called you several times and you didn't answer. Well, I couldn't hear my phone. I overslept, but when I woke up, I called you. That's true. You called me at 10.45, almost three hours after you were supposed to be at work. Yeah, but I called you as soon as I woke up. Yes, and you told me that you would be in to finish your shifts. I did. I came into work as soon as I could. You showed up at 2.30. That's over three hours after you told me you were on your way in. Oh, but I couldn't find daycare for my kids. Didn't you already arrange for daycare because you knew you were on the schedule for 8 a.m.? Well, my daycare won't let me bring the kids in late. Look, we've had this talk before and I've given you several warnings that if you can't show up for work when you were scheduled, I'm going to have to let you go. That's not fair. It's not my fault I couldn't find daycare. No, no, what's not fair is having your co-workers forced to work double shifts because you don't show up to relieve them. Finding daycare for your kids is your responsibility. If you want to work here, you have to be able to show up and work. You can't fire me. It's FMLA, which is Family Medical Leave Act, that states you can't be fired or docked pay if you're staying home to care for a sick family member. Well, were your kids sick? I thought you said you overslept. No, I overslept, uh, but I can't leave my kids without daycare, so it's FMLA. At this point, I step in. Excuse me, I would like to help you here, but if you just don't show up for work, there's no way I can save your job. You've been given more warnings, reprimands, and extra chances than our contract requires, and I don't have any grounds to grieve this termination. It's FMLA! I had to stay with my kids! You can grieve this under FMLA! FMLA only applies if your kids are sick. You just overslept. FMLA! It's because of my kids. I can't leave my kids. FMLA, you can't fire me, she went on and on. Okay, I think we're done here. Here is your termination notice. We're going to ask you to leave the building now. Security will escort you to your locker to clear out your stuff. FMLA, I have kids. You can't fire me if I have kids. Security then shows up and she is escorted to her locker and out of the building. 
all the while screaming at the top of her lungs, they fired me because I have kids. I'm going to sue all of you. I'm going to own this business. You're all going to be fired. I have kids. You can't fire me because I have kids. I can't believe what I'm reading. That is the main thing about this. What is she even saying? Unfortunately, no one explained to her that having a job wasn't all about us agreeing to give you a paycheck. You actually have to show up for the job and do the work. She tried to protest her firing, was denied unemployment, tried to register a complaint against me with the union for failure to represent, the manager for sexual discrimination, and the business for failure to uphold FMLA. Ah, you just can't fix bulletproof stupid. For clarification, she had done this same stunt without the FMLA component five different times before this. Just what? Show up for work? five times and she still had her job i think she still believes she was screwed over on that fmla thing was this woman's argument genuinely i have kids you can't fire me i I don't know why i'm asking you like that It, it was i read it out multiple times she kept saying it for some reason imagine if that was actually like a legal thing you have kids so you can never ever be fired i'd have five kids right now working five different jobs and i would never go to work guys i'd just you know just be chilling earning the money um for doing no work that's for sure and be saying you know what are you gonna do man boss man that's that's paying me fire me i have kids man you can't do that do you not know the law Weird. Imagine if that is how the world worked. It'd be um, pretty backwards. But at least this woman would be right. I mean, seriously, I've never seen something as stupid as... I've got kids, so you can't fire me. What? How brain dead can one individual person be? That's got to be up there for me. Like, what the actual heck is that? You're too young to play tennis. I, a 12-year-old male, and my family go to a tennis court near us a lot. There's three courts with a one-hour limit if someone is waiting. So we go and play. Now, I'm not exactly a feather. I'm pretty thick. I do feel self-conscious when playing, so there's that. Also, my sister is an ace when it comes to tennis. Now, this is relevant for later in the story. So we're playing, and this entitled parent comes over with her two kids. Around maybe 17 to 19 years old, I sense danger. And she immediately tells us to get off the courts. Please get off the courts. We want to play. My mum said, sorry, we got here 10 minutes ago. You'll have to wait a bit. But my kids deserve it more. Now my mum gets a little angry, but still tries to ask her to leave. Then the entitled parent drops the bomb. Besides, my kid is better than your fat, insert Asian slur, over there. And my mum just freaking loses it. See, a Karen is scary, but they have no power when compared to an Asian Karen. And they begin arguing while me and my sister are quietly hitting shots to each other. The two Karens are still at it though, with the entitled parent telling my mum, my daughter is better than yours. To which my mum replies, is she on varsity tennis? And the entitled parent pales. At that exact moment, my sister hits a fat serve and lands it perfectly, making the Karen grab her kids and leave. We laugh and finish our session. And there we go. What a story to start off today's episode. Let me just make this clear, right? Was was OP calling their own mother an Asian Karen? That was... They, they did say that, right? I'm not... You've called your own mother a Karen there. I think she didn't act like one at all. She seemed fine. She was defending her court and her kids. It seemed okay, but hey, you're going to know better than me. Maybe she is a Karen. A Karen v. Karen battle to start off this episode. Incredible scenes. i got to see a follow-up, though. I mean, I've got to see at least a doubles match between the kids or maybe a 1v1 between you and the Karen or a 1v1 between both Karens on the tennis court let it go down whoever wins gets to stay sounds like your sister is very very good she's a varsity tennis player so maybe let her take one of them on and and I just want to see what happens I mean honestly there are loads of events going on right now you know YouTube v TikTok boxing we had um Floyd Mayweather v Logan Paul how about a a Karen v Karen battle I'd pay for that now moving on to our next story entitled parent complains because his kid can't get the summer program he wants. A little backstory. I started fostering this little girl late last year. She is 13 years old and I'm in the process of adopting the girl. Through lots of trials and tribulations, it looks like it's going to happen. The kid will call her Cat to keep things simple. Now, she is smart, truthfully. So, so much smarter than she believes. She doesn't actually have much confidence in herself and I have her seeing a therapist. I guess years and years in the CAS system will do that to you. I managed to get her into a summer program for kids interested in all things related to STEM, 
We've been working on little projects at home, mostly to get her ahead in her school, like making floating concrete fireworks, etc. I took her to an information session yesterday for the program, so she can select what she's going to do in the program. Her session is the first two weeks of August. So yeah, we're there and going through everything and luckily she was able to register for the last open spots in a robotics course. And what would you know, a dad and his little idiots are behind us. Well, he gets up to the table and is all annoyed that there's no more room in the class. And right away, he turns to us to say we should give up the spot for his son. Blah, 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 that his kid wanted to do the class but I politely declined. I've never understood why a simple no sets these people off. But yeah. We are met with, wouldn't the girl prefer to be in a cooking or housekeeping class that she's a girl and girls don't do well in technical fields? I don't lose my cool exactly. I just make the jerk off motion in the air and say snooze you lose and walk away. The guy just continued going off that he's got a man's job. He's a machine operator. His kid is a man that me or my kid wouldn't understand anything. More blah blah BS. More sexism, really. The thing about the summer programs is that they are run by people working in the fields who are using their break to do the classes. And current university students and the man working at the desk interned at the company I worked for last November, right before I left the company. So I knew him. We are friends. He's the reason I found out about the program. He told the guy then, yeah, you know, I interned for her, right? Like she was running the entire department at the company. She's an engineer. I was already walking away at this point and I wish I had a clever line to give him and do the mic drop, but I didn't. It never ceases to amaze me how pig headed people can be. Oh, come on, man. It's 2021. There's no need to bring sexism into the equation just because you're butt hurt that you can't get your kid onto a robotics course. Why can a girl not go on, but your your manly family deserves the son to go on? Like, come on, man. We're not living in the, the, you know, dark age anymore. Get your head out the sand. Are you an ostrich? That is my question. Can I say, actually, if any of you get that reference, then you have surprised me. If you get the reference, comment down below and I'll send you a gift card. I'm not even joking. That is how niche that reference is to probably the majority of you. Comment down below and I'll send you a gift card. I'm genuinely serious. I mean, I'm just reading back again. When the guy said, wouldn't the girl prefer to be in a cooking or housekeeping class? No, she can be in any class she wants. And let's be realistic. She's probably way better than your son at robotics. (laughs) So, so sexist. And now Moving on to our final story of today's episode, front seats. My wife and I live 15 hours away from my family. This is so that she can be close to her family and so that I don't have to deal with mine on a daily basis. The other day, about a week or two ago, we decided to visit my family. When we got there, everything was going great. We were all getting along and happy to see each other. About three hours into our visit, I decided to show my wife around my hometown. She'd never visited before and had only met my folks once at our wedding. Both of my parents volunteer to tag along just in case I get lost. I hadn't been back home in years and some of the roads had changed. We agreed that it was a good idea and started to load up into my car. As I started to buckle up, I noticed my mother is getting into the front passenger seats. I stop and look to my wife who is staring at my mother with a confused expression. Um, mum, I said trying to sound polite because i know the slightest thing can set her off can you hop in the back seat that's my wife's seat and she gets car sickness if she's in the back seats my mother scoffs and rolls her eyes at me she can just sit in the back seat she said exasperated as if she'd explained this thousands of times to me we won't be gone long so she won't get car sick now my wife can get car sick from a three minute drive if she is in the back seat especially when she's around strangers. And yes, my folks are strangers to her. Taking all of this into consideration, I quickly pipe up and say, so can you. I'm not arguing about this with you, mum. This is my car and I want my wife to enjoy being able to look around where I grew up. She scoffs again and turns to my wife and says with the most condescending tone I've ever heard, you won't mind if I take this seat, will you? He's my baby boy, and I haven't been able to see him since you heartlessly took him away from me. Luckily, my wife and I didn't have to do anything because my hero of a father jumped in and told my mother to get out of the car. Now, he isn't the type to deal with BS, and my mother knows this. She quickly hopped out and turned to get into the back seat. 
I sighed in relief for a moment until my father stopped her. We are not going with them, he said, anger very evident on his face as he stepped in front of my mother. We need to talk about how you treat our daughter-in-law. You see, my mother has always hated my wife, whereas my father treats her no different from any of my siblings and I. Needless to say, an argument broke out and my wife and I left without seeing the town. Really guys, all of that just because you wanted to sit next to your son in the front seat of a car for what, a few minute drive? Just go and sit in the back like any normal person with your own husband. It's it's actually so, like, I don't think anyone would ever do that. Like say, you know what? Sorry wife, but I'm sitting in the front. So you're, you're then forcing the wife, like don't even, it doesn't even matter about the car sickness, I don't think, because it's just weird anyway. You would force your son's wife to sit in the back with her father-in-law whilst you sit in the front with your son. It's very strange. Like usually the couples would tend to stay together, right? Unless you'd all agreed on it, then it's completely fine. But it's just a bit weird in principle to even suggest that, let alone go through with it after you know that she has car sickness troubles and is probably not gonna feel very well if she is forced to sit in the back. It's a very strange one. All of that could have been so easily avoided had she just sat in the back, the, the mum, I mean, of course, and then they could have had a nice day, but no, she ruined it. And it's probably a good thing she did, to be honest, because it doesn't sound like you want to be spending too much time with somebody like that. Entitled airline passenger takes a ride on the luggage carousel. I used to fly for work a lot. I have so many entitled people stories, it stops surprising me to run into this behavior. This is one such story. Every single person that has flown also knows about the ridiculousness that happens while trying to pick up their checked luggage at the baggage claim. Why people can't just stand back a few feet and then walk up and get their luggage when they see it so everyone can easily get their luggage, I have no idea, but I digress. While waiting in the baggage claim area, there was suddenly a mad rush of people crowding up to the carousel. Now, I'm not sure if the airport decided to dump 14 or 15 different flights of luggage at the same baggage claim, but there were way more people crowding around the carousel than there should have been. To not get edged out, I walked up to the edge and waited for my luggage. As more and more people piled up around the claim, it was six or seven people deep all the way around the rather large carousel. The belt finally starts moving and I instantly hear a commotion behind me, but I just ignore it at first. After all, we're all doing that same song and dance. Is that my bag? No. Wait, is that my bag? No. Oh, that one? No. Behind me, I hear a random assortment of phrases from the crowd. The likes of, hey, ouch, what are you doing? Cuss words, quit it, you get the point. Apparently, some guy thought he was entitled to forcefully push his way through the crowd to get up to the belt. This individual literally knocks me over into the people beside me pushes me backwards and stands in the six inches of space he makes in front of me. I thought he must see his bag or something. Nope, he just wanted to be up front. Excuse me, I say. He doesn't reply. I lightly push him in the back, for he is an inch in front of my nose, and I say, hey, what do you think you're doing? He doesn't reply again. His mistake was not even acknowledging me and pushing me back again with his butt. Where the heck could I possibly go? Now, I'd like to say I was having a pleasant trip and it didn't set me off, but I would be lying. I'm not exactly the smallest guy. I pushed him with both hands square in his back and sent him onto the luggage belt. He spun onto his back, landed on a bunch of luggage and off he went down the belt. The look on his entitled and rude face was priceless. I didn't know someone's eyes could get that wide. Now, could I have handled it better? Yes. Would it have been more satisfying though? Absolutely not. Even better, remember me saying that the entire carousel was packed all the way around six or seven people deep? Well, he couldn't get off the carousel for there was simply no room for him to hop off. He tried. He flung his feet over the edge only to have them forced back on by the sheer mass of people. Who knows if anyone's luggage actually passed any of us, for everyone was watching this guy ride the belt until he went around the corner and I could no longer see him. I never did know what happened to that guy. Hopefully someone eventually claimed him. 
Okay, I now literally have the best image in my mind possible. Just like thousands of people all crowded around a carousel, all pointing and laughing at this one entitled dude who is fuming, like trapped with loads of luggage, just like trapping him in. Can't stand up, can't get out of what he's doing, just stuck on the carousel, going round and round. Everyone just laughing at him. Pretty incredible that this would happen. And um, if I was one of the crowd members, I wouldn't let him out. I would actively keep him there and make him feel embarrassed as possible. That's just me, guys. Let's move on. Now moving on to our second story. Impatient Karen loses her job. For those not in the know, a mystery shopper is a person assigned by the company to make random unannounced inspections with regards to customer service and in general, the well-being of the company's employees and the store. Also, it is customary for the mystery shopper to blend in with everyday customers and not bring attention to themselves in a way that can be misconstrued as just another obnoxious and rude customer, i.e. act like a douche, get treated like a douche. So pretty much, guys, this story is all about one of those mystery shoppers it's kind of like undercover boss you know someone assigned by the company to go into the store be like an everyday customer but really they're spying and making sure everything is okay when a big boss isn't really there it's a pretty clever idea kind of just a way to make sure that everything is going well day to day in your company without you know going there yourself and all the employees going oh wow that's the boss we're gonna be on our best behavior sort of thing it's kind of like a surprise inspection But anyway, guys, the mystery shopper woman of this story didn't get that memo. One day around lunchtime, my boss was in the back having her lunch. I was out on the shop floor and serving customers, an unusually high amounts, but nothing that I couldn't handle on my own, when in walks this Karen. As I was serving the queue of customers, I half-heartedly said, Hi, welcome to the store. I was hungry, while still serving and ringing through items. Karen said, Hmph. And then under her breath, it's polite to make eye contact. Alarm bells already. She hums and haws while I'm making my way cautiously and correctly through the remaining customers. All the while, she's making daggers and eventually storms off in a huff looking around. Like I can come away from paying customers just to help her. Come on. As the last two customers make their way to the till, she joins the queue with a whole two items with an audible oh, FFS. The customer I'm serving looks at me with a what the actual F expression and I nod. So not even one minute in, the Karen says, this is freaking ridiculous. Finalizing the payments before moving on to the next customer, the till decides to freeze and it takes a few minutes for it to reboot. I make my apologies and the customer I'm serving is fine with it, along with the customer behind. Then Karen says even louder, Oh, for frick's sake, the service in this establishment, she was posh, is absolutely freaking ridiculous. I'd had enough. With my best but annoyed customer service voice and smile, I said, Listen, as you can clearly see, I am dealing with other customers. I am the only staff member on the floor as my boss is at lunch. The till has decided to not play nice. And to be perfectly honest with you, I am well within my rights to refuse you service and ask you to leave as your attitude absolutely stinks. What? You can't talk to me that way. Don't you know who I am? I really don't care to be honest. Now I am once again asking you to leave. Uh, To be fair, that does seem a little bit harsh from OP. She's only, you know, getting a little bit annoyed. It's not the end of the world. Not doing anything that, you know, you'd want to ban her from the store because of. Anyway, she storms off in the foulest mood you'll ever see. And guys, remember, this person, this Karen, is employed by the shop to go in and, you know, pretty much spy. The customer I'm serving says, Thank Christ you said something. I was ready to smack her. We both laugh and I finish both services and thank them for their patience. They both worked in another store where we're based. Now my boss has finally finished her lunch at this point and has come through the front. Oh, I meant to say there's going to be a mystery shopper in at some point. Don't know who, but please be on your best behavior. Oh, frick. Okay, so maybe they do know that a mystery shopper is coming in, but they don't know who it's going to be. I quickly tell her what happened and explain that I was busy, but not too busy. And I needed to involve her and the conversation as it happened. And lo and behold, just as I finished telling her, in walks the regional manager for the company. OP, back office now. I'm dead. Now, knowing that the regional manager has a tendency to be a hothead in this situation, I was pooping bricks at this point. Thankfully, I've had a reasonably good working relationship with him up until this point, so it really could go any way. 
Now, the regional manager was actually pretty calm. What happened? I explained everything. From the moment the Karen entered to the moment she stormed off, almost taking the door with her, and the fact that I had witnesses that worked in the immediate vicinity. The full shebang. The regional manager sighs and nods. I'm finally glad that someone else has the balls to stand up to my wife. What? The look on my face said it all, and he starts to laugh. Please, accept my apologies. I'll let your boss know that there's not to be any repercussions of this. And I think it's time to let my wife know it's time to find more suitable employment. Oh, wow. Um, thanks. I was speechless. He then hands me a £20 gift card for the Moore's Cafe and said lunch was on him. The best coffee and chicken bacon club sandwich i'd ever had yeah let's be honest um i'm not really sure that this karen is doing her role very well at all i think the whole point of a mystery shopper i'll be honest guys i've never actually heard of one before but it you know it makes perfect sense kind of spying on your own company to to make sure everything is you know going well as you as you'd like as the regional manager would like um the main role surely is just to blend into the background be completely inconspicuous not cause a fuss and just ultimately kind of gain information and report back to the regional manager and say you know what everything is under control everything is going well all the staff are polite everything is working smoothly or report about the opposite you know just just make sure that you are not the center of attention that is the point you need to be like a comedian blend in maybe you know ask a couple of questions speak to the, all the employees because that's what a normal customer would do you know as you're going through the till getting your stuff speak to them say you're having a nice day see if they're polite doing their job correctly all that sort of stuff but don't like start mouthing off and and complaining after two minutes what's that all about you just know as well that this boss was like oh you know what Come on then wife. I'll give you a job. Uh, yeah, just go go into stores. Please be calm None of your usual entitled Karen behavior. Just be calm report back to me with some behavior if anything is awry And she can't even do that. She has to you know She can't help but but act entitled be entitled and say I want to be served now You're not even there to get for, you're not shopping that you're not a normal customer You're there to do a job and to, to gather information and report back. Why are you you know mouthing off? I don't get it, but um, yeah <laughs> It's quite embarrassing to be employed and then fired by your own husband for a job that is so easy. Let's be realistic. Wow, just just so, so good from her. Drunk entitled mum thinks it's my responsibility to watch her kids while she continues to drink. Like millions of other people, at the beginning of the pandemic, I lost my job. Fortunately, I managed to obtain another job delivering desserts for a bakery. Now this particular shop was really small, but it had two small counters in the front window facing outside. Pre-pandemic, these counters would allow a couple of people to sit and enjoy their sweets while watching the world go by. During the pandemic, our city allowed no indoor dining, so we could have customers come in and order, but they had to leave the shop to eat elsewhere. Additionally, last fall, the city shut down the streets in front of the shop, to allow the numerous restaurants on the street room for outdoor dining. On slow days, I would use one of the counters to set up my laptop to try and find another job and also people watch. One particularly slow Saturday afternoon, I noticed two kids, probably four and six, running amok. These kids were annoying diners and just creating a nuisance, including pulling down some promotional material we had out front. I finally located their mother, the entitled mum of this story, who was sitting halfway down the block with someone else with several bottles of wine on the table. Finally, I had a delivery just as the very visibly intoxicated entitled mum comes into the shop with her two kids. I hop on my bike and take off. About 10 minutes later, I come back and immediately see these two kids are at the counter and it's a complete disaster. There's ice cream all over the counter, the window and the wall and the entitled mum is nowhere to be seen. I walk into the back and ask the shift lead why the kids are eating in the shop. He doesn't even bother to look up from his phone and shrugs his shoulders. At this point, I'm irritated because these kids are destroying the front of the shop and I'm going to have to clean it up. I decide to go out and find and confront the entitled mum. I say to her, I'm sorry, but because of city ordinances, your kids cannot eat inside the shop. Where are they supposed to eat then? The entitled mum slurs back. She's literally sitting at a foretop with two empty chairs. Well, they can eat anywhere other than inside the shop. I'm busy right now. As she takes another very healthy drink of wine. If you cannot get them right now, I'm gonna have to call the police. 
We can't risk a fine and closure because your kids are eating inside. Oh, F you. At this point, I start walking back to the shop. The entitled mum must have realized that this could end very badly for her if she doesn't get her kids and stumbles after me. At this point, all she needs to do is go into the shop, tell the kids to grab their ice cream sandwiches and leave. Or just leave the ice cream sandwiches for me to clean up. But no, she takes it to the next level. She walks in and grabs the first kid's ice cream sandwich and loudly slurs, That butthole is making me throw away your ice cream. She then proceeds to slowly walk the 10 feet across the shop to the trash can while just glaring at me. All the while, the kid pleading with her not to throw his ice cream away. The first ice cream sandwich goes into the trash can. She then slowly walks back over to the second child, grabs his ice cream and proceeds to again keep glaring at me while she walks back to the trash can and throws it away. By now, both kids are absolutely hysterical. A potential customer walks in, sees what is happening, and promptly leaves. In one last act of defiance, the entitled mum grabs the napkin holder, throws it on the ground, and drunkenly screams at me, F you, I'll get you fired. Finally, she was gone. I walked into the back to see the shift lead still firmly planted on his butt, looking at his phone. I grabbed the cleaning supplies to start cleaning up the store. Now, I've not worked in the restaurant or hospitality industry since I was in college in the late 90s, and I never remember putting up with rubbish like this back then. Honestly, guys, the idea of a woman being out in a public place, just getting absolutely obliterated on alcohol, and then being, you know, in charge, responsible of her kids at the same time is disgusting. It doesn't even matter if she's entitled or not. Like, just that idea is ridiculous. And realistically, no sane person or no good parent would ever do that. I mean, you're in danger your children so much by by putting yourself in that position it's so stupid honestly i know it's pretty deep but if i was in that situation and you see this woman just downing wine and her kids just as you said running a mock call the police it's not your problem i know it's like you probably don't want to do it and it seems a little bit harsh but call the police because honestly these children are in danger with their mum just getting smashed on wine not even looking after them now moving on to our second story of today's episode entitled aunt nearly ruins free vacation Little disclaimer guys, this story happens before the pandemic. I love Ireland. My grandmother told me stories and inspired a pride and love for my heritage and taught me how to properly represent myself. Now I'm not Irish, but my ancestors were. Years ago, I started studying Gaelic, the Irish language. Now I'm still very novice at speaking and understanding it, but I do enjoy trying to learn and I like hearing it spoken. I was starting to think about another trip when one of my cousins contacted me. We never had much contact because we grew up so far apart, but I liked him well enough. He'd started learning Irish and was interested in having someone to practice with. So we did. We helped each other and learned together. It's a difficult language and like I said, still very novice. Well, I was planning a trip to Ireland. I've been a few times, but this time I wanted to stay in the Gaeltacht, the regions of Ireland where Gaelic, Irish, is primarily spoken instead of English. The people there do speak English, but as a second language. I thought my cousin would enjoy a trip as well. I spoke with my uncle and we made a deal. Since my cousin was in his first year of college, I told him if he finished his freshman year with at least a 3.5 GPA, I would pay for him to go with me. He worked really hard and was mostly taking honors classes and came out with a 3.4. I of course let him feel a little grief from trying so hard only to come up short. Then I told him he'd still be going with me. You could say I shouldn't have, but he genuinely worked very hard and I believe he earned it. Plus, he's a good kid and I want to encourage him to keep working hard in his education. Now, for a quick little bit of background on my cousin's parents. Aunt Kat and Uncle Tom are people of limited means. Not speaking poorly of them, Uncle Tom works hard to give them a comfortable life. Aunt Kat is my dad's sister and the grandmother I mentioned earlier is her mum. Uncle Tom is the son of Italian immigrants. While trying to put my cousin Ben through school, they couldn't afford to send him on vacation but I assured them the whole trip was on me. I actually was splurging a bit because I wanted it to be an awesome experience for my cousin. I got business class seats for the flights and booked two rooms at a really nice bed and breakfast. 
I was excited, but my cousin was so pumped he was shaking. Then Uncle Tom calls me and asks if there was any chance I could include him and Aunt Kat on the trip. He understood it was a huge thing to ask and stressed that it was no pressure. I thought about it a bit and decided I would bring them along. My grandmother would have praised the generosity. I told them that since it was so close to the trip, I could only get them economy seats and he said it was fine. I also managed to book another room at the B&B. I also stressed that the purpose of this trip was for cousin Ben and I to interact with native Irish speakers, but there would be time for some sightseeing. We could also visit the town our ancestors came from in County Mayo. This is where I learned what a Karen my aunt Kat is. It started at the airport. I'd managed to upgrade their tickets to Economy Plus, which on an international flight is not too bad. But my aunt was saying that my cousin and I should sit there while the grown-ups get the nice seats. I was 30 at the time and my cousin was 19. My uncle looked embarrassed. My aunt told cousin Ben to give her his ticket and he almost did. I had to nip this in the bud. I paid for all these seats so I would determine who sits where. Those are still nice seats. Enjoy your flight. Yeah, I mean, Economy Plus on an international flight. I've done it before. It's very nice. A big upgrade on economy, that is for sure. Aunt Kat then said, Oh, so since you paid for everything, you think you're in charge? Yes. And if you don't like it, you can go home. She huffed, but stayed silent. Uncle Tom gave me a wink, and Cousin Ben apologized for his mum's behavior. At one point, he quietly said to himself, She always does this. Great. We arrive in Ireland and took a cab to our bed and breakfast. The first two days were great. Cousin Ben and I went out and tried to awkwardly converse with the locals who were as gracious as you could wish for and helped us a lot. We mostly did stuff separately from my aunt and uncle, which was fine. But I noticed my aunt was getting a little edgy. And on our fourth morning at breakfast, she snapped. One of the girls working at the bed and breakfast brought them their breakfast and apparently greeted them in Gaelic, like she did every morning. That was the point where everyone there began to hear, does anyone in this freaking place speak English? Jesus Christ, it's like being in a foreign country. My grandmother lived her whole life here. She can speak English. Why can't you? Before I could appreciate that my aunt had actually said it's like being in a foreign country, I was out the door and running across the yard. I apologized to the poor girl and gave her a 50 euro note, then went to talk to my aunt. Do you not understand what I told you about this part of Ireland? I thought I explained that Irish Gaelic is the primary language spoken here. Most people will start interactions in Irish and it's a big part of the B&B's business too. She just sat in her room looking huffy and Uncle Tom told me he'd handle it. He'd fallen in love with Ireland and had been thoroughly enjoying the trip, so I let him deal with it. Then I went to talk to the landlady to ensure we wouldn't be thrown out. Now she of course didn't tolerate mistreatment of her staff, but she said if it did happen again, they would have to leave. That day, I had rented a car and would be driving out to where my ancestors originally lived near Castle Bar. I invited my aunt and uncle, but my aunt just stayed in the room, so the three of us went out without her. It was an emotional thing visiting that little village, and I can't describe it, but my cousin and I both felt like we could feel the spirits of our ancestors there. I know it's corny, but it was powerful. We found the graves of some of them as well. Now my uncle was mostly silent and respectfully let us experience it. Later, he told us about his parents leaving Italy. The rest of the trip was pretty quiet, but Aunt Kat never left the room or spoke to anyone there. Although she did charge a pretty expensive lunch to the room on my card through a local high-class restaurant. Uncle Tom offered to pay me back for it, but I refused. We flew back and the whole flight, my cousin was going on and on about how amazing it was. It was clear that he'd found a new love for international travel. So I told him if he keeps his grades up, maybe we could go again the next summer. All right, and there we go. Um, Yeah, hopefully you guys can go on more fun trips abroad, not just to Ireland, but to other places as well. Clearly, you've, you know, you spark some love for traveling there from your cousin Ben. But um, yeah, maybe maybe next time don't include, well, at least not both parents. Tom can come. He seems like a good bloke, but um, Aunt Kat, nah. If she's just gonna go to another country, well, I mean, country, she said she didn't even realize it was a foreign country. Incredible scenes. But if she's gonna go and just sit in her room and, you know, just be horrible and miserable the whole time, no point in her going anywhere. 
But yeah, instantly when when she said, "Okay, because we're adults, because we're the older ones, we get to sit in the uh, in the business class seats," despite her getting a free vacation. From that point on, it was going to be pretty obvious that yeah, this was not going to be a smooth sailing trip with her. That is for sure. Entitled grandmother makes my brain collapse. Literally, this happened two years ago. I was sharing an apartment with a friend. Now my ex friend from high school. Let's call her Flo. Flo was really lazy. She wouldn't clean the apartment or even wash her own dishes. And when I'd ask her to do it, she'd get mad and act like a freaking child. After a year, she decided to move. That's when the entitled grandmother of this story appears. She demanded for me to pay back her part of the money that she paid to me for Flo's rent and also to pay the money she put in to pay half the deposit. I put in the other half. I didn't agree with this. So for a period of a month approximately, Flo and her entitled grandma harassed me, coming into my apartment at any time without letting me know they had keys, threatening to call the police, to call my mother, etc. The entitled grandma also threatened to take my furniture as a payment if I didn't give her the money. They caused me a lot of stress. I couldn't leave my place because I didn't know when they'd be back. And as both of us, Flo and me, were in the contract, I couldn't call the cops because it was still Flo's place too. One morning, the entitled grandma came around at around 7 a.m. I was sleeping, so it took me like 50 minutes to get up and get dressed. And when I got out of my room to say hello, the entitled grandma was really angry because she'd had to wait and not so subtly called me a prostitute. She hinted that I was working nights as a sexual worker and that's why I wasn't awake when she came. At 7 freaking a.m. by the way, completely by surprise, she didn't even call. We had a big argument because she's a crazy woman and she even had the courage to blame me for the death of her husband that occurred like five months ago at that time who was sick from the heart for about five years, even before I met Flo. The guy died in hospital because of his illness. It really had nothing to do with me. I actually only saw him about two times in my entire life. Now, going back to the origin of the title, entitled grandmother makes my brain collapse, literally. The next morning of that argument, I woke up and I was seeing double. I couldn't focus my eyes. I panicked, ran to the mirror, and saw that my left eye was completely crossed. I looked like a person with strabismus. So I rushed to the doctor and he told me that the stress that perhaps had been caused by the entitled grandma and Flo was causing me to make my brain lose control of my eye and that I needed to slow down and relax because the thing in my eye could be dangerous if it went on for a while. And that's my story about how a crazy woman caused me nervous strabismus. Guys, before we even dive into talking about this one, I firstly got to find out exactly what strabismus means. I have no idea what it is, never heard of it, and I assume the majority of you haven't heard of it as well. Let's go to Wikipedia. All right, so, oh my God, look at that photo. Strabismus is a condition in which the eyes do not properly align with each other when looking at an object. The eye that is focused on an object can alternate. The condition may be present occasionally or constantly. Okay, L- yeah, that photo is a bit mad. Um, Stress can do that to you. That's crazy. I had no idea. Wow, that must have been a, a horrifically stressful, you know, incident or event that played out over a number of weeks, OP, for you to end up, you know, having this sort of condition. I hope it's fixed now, by the way. It says it's only temporary. Well, it can be temporary. I hope it was for you because you're looking like that for your life. That's not good. Now moving on to our second story of today's video. Entitled mother tries stealing my kayak from my car roof. There was a sale today at a warehouse type store that ends with co. Brand new kayaks were being sold for super cheap and fully equipped. We arrived a few minutes before opening and the staff pointed us to where we could get a kayak. There were only 18 available and only three were left. We took one and 15 minutes later, they announced that there were no more kayaks available. Now, some people were disappointed, but no one really made a fuss about it. No one except Karen. She started huffing and stomping her feet in front of the entrance staff, claiming that you shouldn't advertise kayaks if you don't have enough for everyone, and that she deserved to have a kayak because they're just so expensive and I have a family to feed. How does that make any sense, by the way? The staff politely explained that they would receive some more over the weeks and that she could come back at that time. She waved her hand at the staff and made her way back to her car. At that point, me and my mum were loading the kayak onto the top of our car. My mum went into the store to get some groceries and I stayed in the car as I wasn't feeling well. About 10 minutes later, I hear rattling coming from the side of the car. 
I took a look and there was the entitled mum with two of her crotch goblins trying to undo the straps and take the kayak. I jumped out of the car and said pretty loudly, may I help you? Here's the conversation that followed. Go away. We're just loading our kayak onto our car. Yeah, that's my car. I'm going to have to ask you to leave or I'm calling the cops. Uh, Can't you see I'm a struggling mum? I just need the kayak to make my kids happy. Look at them. They're so sad not to have one. Her kids were still trying to undo the straps, which they were barely able to reach. Please take your hands off the straps, kids. That's my car. Don't you talk to my kids that way. I'll have you arrested for something I can't say in fear of being demonetized, but have a look at the screen now if you want to know what I can't say. I just want the kayak and then we'll go. Why can't you do a good gesture for us? Because it's mine and you're crazy lady. I didn't even touch your kids. I'm giving you one last chance to go back to your car or I'm calling the cops. The entitled mum stood there with her arms crossed and gave me a defiant look. That was all I needed and I called the cops. They arrived maybe 10 minutes later and the entitled mum had gotten back to trying to untie the straps. I let her do it because I thought the cops would see her and it would just be more proof. And gosh, was I right? As soon as they stepped foot outside of their car, they asked the entitled mum to get away from my car and they wanted to ask her a couple of questions. She huffs and tells the police that the kayak is hers and that she paid for it. I just show them my receipts and they say it's all okay. As they saw her untying the straps, they asked if I wanted to press charges and I said, heck yeah. At that point, my mum was back and after a brief explanation, we loaded the groceries and drove away. The police stayed with the entitled mum and we could hear her screaming and whining about my kayak being stolen and how she will be doing something about this. Me and my mum just laughed and I'm currently enjoying a relaxing fishing day in my kayak. Well, it's great to hear there was a positive ending to this story. This one actually reminds me of something that happened to me in my life. I guess my family really more than me, but um, I was involved. Uh, I'm pretty sure we were at some sort of service station somewhere getting a bit of food on some family trip. And we all had our bikes on top of the car on a bike rack. And um, me and my sister, for some reason, were still in the car. I think just us two. My parents might have gone inside to get something, come back out or whatever. When they came back out, there were only three bikes on the car. My mum's bike wasn't there. Now, we're pretty sure what might have happened is somebody without me and my sister knowing for some weird reason had just you know come up by the back of the car probably so we couldn't see and just taken my mum's bike off the car but we're not exactly sure we did actually end up going back the way we come along the motorway trying to look if the bike had you know maybe fallen off as we were driving or something but we would honestly have heard it if you know if you're driving along and something falls off your car you're gonna realize aren't you let's be honest it's a bike it's not like a little feather um and we couldn't find it so we're pretty sure to this day that uh yeah someone had just come along taken the bike off the car whilst we're in the service station i just don't know how me and my sister didn't realize thankfully in this story op did realize because it's pretty obvious but yeah to this day i don't know how we didn't realize that someone had stolen the bike so there's still that little part of me that is not entirely sure but um i think that's what happened in that situation and now moving on to our final story of today's episode entitled group tries to steal the garage we rented my wife and i both ride motorcycles and we've started doing track days together we've rented a garage next to our friends so we can hang out between sessions renting a garage is more than 50 dollars per day but it means we have space out of the sun power for the tire warmers and plumbed airlines for setting tire pressures or running tools We think it's worth it. We showed up for our track day and our assigned parking spot for the garage was filled with other trucks and trailers and someone had set up in our garage. They were still unloading more bikes and tools. The guy even put down a rug. The head guy of the group said he'd rented the garage for the following two days, race days, and wanted it for the track day for testing and tuning his bike. He said he had a garage for the day booked at the far end of the track and it's okay, you can go and use that one. Like it was a done deal. I told him no, that we'd booked and paid for this garage for most of the season for a reason. He got huffy and said he didn't want to move all his stuff. But I was done at this point. We needed to unload and the trailer was blocking the paddock road. I told him, sorry, but that's not my problem. He knew what garage he booked. He saw the reservation posted on the wall with our names and decided to move in regardless. Plus, he had a garage to use. It just wasn't in a prime spot. I pulled the car in behind their truck close enough to block the tailgate so they couldn't set up the ramp to get the other bikes out and began unloading our own gear into the garage. 
He finally packed up and his friends stopped unloading. Yeah, I mean, you know you haven't rented that garage. You see it's reserved in the windows. It's obviously going to be reserved. You've got your own one down the line. What's the, like, I, I, I don't know why you would even bother. Like, how far away is your other one? How, you know, inconvenienced are you going to be by going to the one that you actually bought or rented? I just, you're setting yourself up for failure and a massive loss of time because it sounds like a pretty popular spot. You know, you have to reserve a garage. There are lots along a big old line and, and you can't just jump in. Why would you, why would you then try to steal someone else's knowing full well that it's a very high chance that they're going to come and want to use it given they've reserved it and their names on it. I just don't know because you're just, I mean, you're costing all your mates loads of time by setting up, getting stuff back in the garage, going down to your actual garage. It just seems like you're costing your mates loads of time and losing it because, you know, you'll be putting all your stuff in someone else's garage. Then, oh no, what a surprise just to put it back in the truck, go down to your actual garage, put it in that. Knowing this group they're probably just trying to steal someone else's garage as well i mean lots of garages going on um <laughs> weird one again how trying to sell a wee to a friend ended up with me losing money and burnt bridges so i've been trying to leave this whole mess behind and i figured ranting about it on the web could help now i know there were probably many things that i did wrong or could have handled better so i'll accept any criticism wholeheartedly get comfortable guys this is a long one that's what she said for some backstory I've been friends with this guy, let's call him Sid, for what would have been seven years if the following events didn't happen. Since I saw him as such, we did many activities together, many hangouts and sleepovers. In my house, he hardly ever invited me to his, and even him staying for a week after his dad kicked him and his mum out of the house. Needless to say, we were close at the time, which is why I had such a hard time putting my foot down and even cutting ties with him throughout all of this. Prior to this mess, I've been thinking of selling my Wii console, along with two controllers and 30 plus games, for a while, but I used to always set it aside or just forget about it. Around July of last year, because of the virus, I decided I could use the money, so I started the process of actually selling my Wii. I researched a bit to set a price. 8,000 to 9,000 Argentinian pesos, so roughly 85 to 95 US dollars. I'd seen similar bundles nearing those prices online. Note, I know that some numbers in the story may seem messed up, but so is our economy, so please just roll with it, oh my god. Anyway, on to the story. Sid had already shown interest for the Wii, but because I wanted to sell it for good money and not take it out of a friend's hands, I, for whatever reason, told him that I would most likely look for a buyer on the internet. After much insisting on his part, I decided to sell it to him. Discounted, of course, because we were friends at the time. Instead of going for the original 8,000 pesos, I lowered it to 6,500, so around $70. He actually tried to talk me into taking 6,000, but I took it as a joke and brushed it off, telling him the price was firm. Even when I'd made it clear how much it was, he had a second problem. He said his girlfriend didn't like the idea of him spending that much. Yes, I now know that sounds dumb. As always, hindsight is 2020. For reference, he didn't live with said girlfriend just yet, and they've been dating for about a year. Not much of a reason to have a say on how he spent his money. Whatever, he wanted to cut me a deal. He'd at first pay me one and a half thousand pesos for the Wii, and then 500 each month. So that would be $16 up front, and then $5 monthly, until the full price was paid off. I decided to just take it. Like I said, I needed the money. The second problem was after we made the transaction. Since I lost the original box for the Wii, I decided to put the console, the accessories, and the games inside a set of three boxes, as neatly as I could. I also, of course, turned on the Wii to see if it still worked and ran all of the games through it the night before. I did my best to make sure everything was in condition, which it was. The only exception was the charger, whose cable had a bit of plastic recoil from the transformer, so its wires were visible. Now, I had offered to fix this, but Sid said he'd handle it. Well, after a while, he came to pick it up. Sid then sent me a message complaining that the charger's cable had broken. The messages had an accusatory tone, as if it were my fault, and not because he took the console without much care. That is the opposite of what I warned him to do when he took it, by the way. However, reluctantly, I agreed to pay half of what it would cost to fix it. Other than that, things seemed to be going well. I took the 1500, we split the cost of the fix, which is 500 pesos each. I took note of how much Sid owed me after this so I wouldn't forget, and I waited. And I waited, and I waited, 
for six to seven months. In said time, I ended up losing my job and getting a gig that doesn't pay as much. I told Sid many times to please either give me at least part of what he owed me or tell me when he could do it because I was having a bit of a hard time. What was he doing in the meantime, you ask? Well, he was going out with friends, including but not limited to our friend group, buying gifts for his girlfriend and taking her on dates, and he freaking bought an apartment. Yeah, you heard me right, guys. He hadn't finished paying me back before settling a deal to move into an apartment, including the obvious deposits, rent, and utilities, which he actually used as an argument to justify why he didn't have money. Needless to say, I got annoyed more and more as we approached February, with me not receiving another cent from Sid. All right, so at this point, Sid is saying that he's not able to pay back $5 a month but he is able to buy an apartment. Okay, very interesting, Sid. Finally, during a phone call, he mentioned that he could finally give me the 2,000 that he owed me. The thing is, if you kept up with the math, he actually still owed me 4,500. So not only did he keep me waiting for half a year, but he tried to lowball me for a second time. I cut that conversation short, hoping I'd misunderstood something, but no. I later reminded him to please let me know when he could hand me the 4,500 pesos he'd yet to pay me. He started arguing that it was 2,000 because he'd given me the 1,500, then 2,000 out of the total of 6,000, which I hadn't even agreed to. I tried to argue that 6,500, which was the original price, minus 500 for the charger fix, minus 1,500, what he gave me, equaled the remaining 4,500. But no, he was convinced he'd actually paid me more, even though he hadn't. After a short back and forth, he basically texted me that he was sick of arguing and to go to his house the next day to get the Wii and give back his one and a half thousand pesos, which he at first said was more. The thing is, I couldn't gather the money unless I managed to sell the console again. So I said that I'd given the money as soon as I could get it. He either didn't acknowledge that statement or chose to ignore it and just said that he'd give back the console and to hand back the money. I was so frustrated that my mum noticed something was wrong and asked me what happened. After I told her, she sat me down and helped me realise that Sid was an exploiter. I'd been there for him more times than I could count, done so many favours and here he was, screwing me over. She was pretty mad about it too and asked me if I wanted her to come with me for support the next day. But I said that wasn't necessary. I still had her drive me there because I ended up running late to the time Sid had set for me to come round. Now, here is where I very likely messed up. I went the next day and took the console back, but I didn't have the money. I'll admit that this was because I obviously couldn't get it on such short notice, but also because I felt it was hypocritical of him to keep me waiting for my money for six to seven months, yet expect me to get it at the drop of a hat. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, guys, that is completely fair enough. Once I got to his place, Sid nonchalantly gave me the console in a suspiciously small bag. I didn't pay much attention to that detail since I was tired of this whole ordeal and wanted to get it over with. He demanded the money and got offended when I said I didn't have it. Being almost out of patience, I answered, look, you've kept me waiting for six months for this. Give me at least a couple of days. Then I got in the car and left. Now, while in the car, I decided to actually check the bag Sid had given me more thoroughly. That's when I noticed it. The 30 plus games that I'd given Sid, all inside of their boxes, paper envelopes I brought them in, were now 10 CDs tucked into a package. I called Sid, fuming, and asked him where the missing games went. He had sold them each for 10 pesos, not even a tenth of their actual worth, to pay for his half of the cost to fix the charger without telling me. I just blew up and told him that selling the Wii would be much harder now, then demanded he got the games back. His only answer was, give me the one and a half thousand pesos and I'll get you the games. Now, all of this was on speakerphone, since I had my phone in one hand and the bag with the Wii in the other. So after hearing this, my mum had also had enough. She grabbed the phone out of my hand and tore into him as well. I ended up blocking his contact after I saw a text of his that read, if I give you something, you're supposed to give me the money, which he'd sent before the call. I was just tired of this train wreck of a deal and wanted to talk it out after taking some time to clear my head. The thing is, Sid didn't give me any time. 
he went on the group chat we had with our friends to throw me under the bus claim how much of an idiot and a scammer i was and then kick me out of the group they didn't even know what was going on so my friends got quite a surprise to not make a long story longer someone else put me back in the chat we discussed it and well some harsh language was thrown around Sid defended himself, saying he didn't pay me back because he had to fix his apartment and that I should be more sympathetic. The thing is, he decided to get the apartment on his own. I didn't see how I was to be held liable because he got a place he couldn't afford. He also didn't tell me any of this. He kept me in the dark, waiting for a payment that I never got. In the end, I was willing to negotiate to get the games back in exchange of giving Sid the 1500 pesos. He, however, wanted to cut all ties because there is no friendship here. He didn't want the money back nor have anything else to do with me. And honestly, I just accepted this. Not just because of the Wii issue, but this whole thing helped me look back on more trashy attitudes he'd had and overall him being a negative person. For instance, he once told me I had too high of a standard for going for girls I found pretty. Me being me. And now I have a Wii with over half of the games missing, which as I later realized, he had factory reset. Something to note, the Wii was chipped, which means it had a program installed to run games that are not exactly original, but cheaper. This is common practice where I live and the games usually work fine. Now, because of the reset, said program was gone, which means the games are basically useless. The cost to set it back up is currently 2,800 pesos, 1,300 more than Sid originally gave me. I lost money and games trying to sell this guy my console. As for Sid, I hadn't much news from him since I cut contact. Last I heard, he actually had a fight with another friend from our circle and left two group chats we were both involved in. So that's the story of how a failed attempt of selling a console cost me a seven-ish year old friendship and made me decide I'll never sell something to a friend again. I'll admit, I was sad because of the outcome at first, but life goes on. I'll just try again when I get the Wii back in selling condition, then move on with my life. If you've listened to this whole story all the way to the end, let me tell you that you're a legend and I hope this story entertained you as much as it frustrated me. The main takeaway for me, guys, in this story is that OP, I'm sorry to say, but the thing that you had with Sid, it wasn't real friendship. Yes, you might have been friends for years, seven years, but it was such a one-way friendship that it really wasn't that, you know, mutually beneficial at all, was it? He was just using you, you were having to deal with all his rubbish and he was just pretty much just taking advantage of, of you existing existing whilst you were just you know lying down and letting him kind of walk over you like a mat not saying that's your fault at all but uh, maybe you should have realized earlier but even though you didn't this was a good event i reckon on the whole to make you to make you realize that this guy is not someone you want to be spending time with he's not a friend he's not someone you can trust and ultimately he's someone that's going to try and scam you and pretty much did I've got to say, though, OP sounds like, I mean, you'd love to be mates with him, wouldn't you? He's so caring. He's so kind. He gives you six to seven months to repay you. What a nice guy. And to be let down by someone like this. Oh, I feel bad that, you know, people like OP, they're very few. They're few and far between. They're such rare people. So innocent, so kind, so generous. And to get walked over by people like Sid and we should really just be protecting them and nourishing them as people is such a shame to see. But um, yeah, OP, if it's any consolation, I'd like to be friends with you. Uh, if you want a new friend, mate, I'm not desperate or anything. Just you sound like a good guy. All right, let's leave it there. <laughs> but if you transition, it'll be inconveniencing me. Hey everyone, a while back I posted in r slash am I the butthole about a person in my choir who wheedled their way into getting a solo performance without any agreement from the rest of the group. Now I was deemed the butthole for not backing them up for said performance, but it didn't really matter in the end because I was in hospital for the duration of that concert anyway. But that's a whole other barrel of monkeys. I come here today with another story about this person and their entitled behavior. This happened yesterday and I'm still pretty irritated. So some backstory. The choir I'm part of is a queer centric choir. It's supposed to be a comfortable and accepting place for LGBTQ plus folks. And it was, but the entitled person of the story frequently causes other people to be uncomfortable, annoyed or just plain put off. They are extremely pushy overly critical and have a not so subtle habit of rolling their eyes and muttering under their breath when someone asks for help on their section's part. 
They're rude and pretty ignorant. There are so many more things, but I'm not here to write a novel, just a novella. I am an out and proud bi and trans person. With the whole being stuck at home during quarantine, I've had a lot of time to figure out myself and my identity further. And I've decided that I'm gonna go to a gender counselor and talk to them about starting HRT after lockdown is fully lifted. When I shared this revelation with my choir via Zoom meeting, almost everyone was really supportive except for the entitled person. Their first reaction was, but you were really strong soprano. If you transition, you'll just be leaving me and one other member of the choir in that section. To be honest, I kind of expected them to say some BS like that, but I'm surprised how calmly I replied with, okay, but I'm not doing this in terms of what the choir wants. I'm doing this for me. Choir has always been secondary. The choir director, manager, and all other choir members backed me up in saying that, and the entitled person fell silent. I got no apology though, no acknowledgement of how rude they'd just been. They just sulked and didn't say anything more until the topic changed. I've been thinking of leaving the choir for a while now, mainly because of this entitled person's behavior. It's just not fun for me anymore. It's another reason to get stressed out and annoyed, and I'm not about that life. This is just another straw on the camel's back. And the next practice we have may just be the one where I return my music and quit. So yeah, I just wanted to get that out there. Maybe I'm being a bit entitled and bratty too for considering quitting, but come on, who says that to someone when they come out with that kind of news in an LGBTQ plus choir? OP, please, whatever you do, do not leave the choir. It sounds like it's fantastic. You're with a great bunch of people and the only reason you may not be enjoying it for this one period of time is because of this one entitled person. I mean, come on, it's an LGBTQ plus choir. The whole point of it is being open with each other, you know, and, and accepting about, you know, it's like, sexuality i don't get it i just don't get it at all if anything surely it should be the entitled person that gets kicked out and not you having to leave seriously like it should be obvious to everyone look no one wants to kick anyone out of a group let's be fair enough on that it's not a nice thing to do but if they're the person that is causing other people like yourself to leave because you can't stand being in the same group as them then unfortunately they're the ones that need to go and i just hope the rest of the members of your choir see that and actually you know make sure that you're not the one that that leaves and that it's actually the other way around in the end now moving on to our second story she tried to invite a no contact guest for some context my family's a little awkward i'm limited contact with my mum due to years of abuse towards me physical and emotional and i'm fully no contact with my younger sister due to her being well a terrible person in general hateful super homophobic thinks people in the LGBT community choose to be victims because they like being treated badly, that being gay is a choice, that LGBT people don't deserve to be treated like actual people, etc. These are all things that she said to me, a member of said community. And my mum knows this. What a start to this story, my God. So a couple of days ago, my amazing future mother-in-law wanted to take me dress shopping to get ideas for a wedding dress along with my cool older sister. We debated whether or not to invite my mum, eventually deciding that the drama of not inviting her would be worse than anything she could do. We were waiting for my mum at a restaurant to meet up with her before dress shopping. And that's when I got a call from my older sister. She said, you might want to let mum know you don't want your younger sister coming with. She just said she's invited her. I hung up and called my mum, starting out with, no, my sister is not coming. And she immediately started in with a whining voice, making her voice sound like she was going to cry, begging me with phrases like, but why? And can't you just get along for me? And I know you had an argument. Yes, she called my younger sister, saying all those things to me, a simple argument. But can't you just move past it? And I already told her those topics are off limits. I don't see the big deal. I kept repeatedly saying no, but she kept getting worse. Her voice getting whinier, pleading with me and acting like I was ruining her entire day by not letting my younger sister come with. Finally, I snapped and said, no, mum, she is not coming. There was a beat of silence. Then, in the saddest, most dejected crocodile tear sounding voice I've ever heard, she replied, Fine, okay, I'll be there in a bit. Thankfully, that was the end of it. She arrived, we ate, she was cordial, 
But oh my god, the lion, the witch, and the audacity of this. <laughs> That's very good, by the way. She was only invited by a slim margin. Then she just turned around and tried to invite someone I'm no contact with behind my back. Yeah, there's a reason I'm limited contact with her. Yikes. Well then, a little bit of an LGBTQ plus theme to this video. Hope you guys are enjoying it. Um, it's very strange that two sisters can be obviously related and hate each other so much to the degree that, that this sister, OP's sister, well, I don't to be fair, it's not even OP, is it? It's just her sister. Like, OP's a completely normal person. Seems pretty nice to me. Her sister's just off the rails. How can you be that mean and horrible and abusive towards your own sister? I don't get it. Especially like, obviously like when you're kids, you might fight and stuff, but actually saying those horrible abusive things about someone's sexuality your sister's I mean, it's just it's unbelievable i can't really understand what you would gain from that i mean she must genuinely believe the things she's saying because they're so outlandish that you wouldn't just say them for a bit of chat would you or to make a joke just a horrible abusive person i'm sorry op that that is your sister and to be fair to your mum, whilst you're obviously still limited contact with her for a reason i think she should probably understand that, that you don't want to see your younger sister Who's the most horrible person that it sounds like ever existed? Because come on, she's just horrible about everything that you that you stand for and that you are as a person. I get it that your mum obviously wants her two daughters to be friends, but after all the years of your younger sister abusing you, she should probably see that that's not gonna happen. And now moving on to our final story of today's episode. You need your ADA compliance stool, but I'm tired. For some background, I'm a cashier at my local Wally World. Most of the time, the people that I work with are really nice and management is great. However, due to the nature of my store, we occasionally get some crazy people. This happened about a year ago at my store, just before the shutdowns and mask wearing. Additionally, I have a rare muscular disability, so I have a stool that I purchased that I use while I'm working. While I can walk short distances and stand for short periods of time, I get in a lot of pain if I do it for a while. I do have a wheelchair, but I typically don't use it at work since I don't walk too much at my lane and the stool is a lot less bulky. I also typically work a small, belted self-checkout lane. Now for the story. So I'm working at my typical self-checkout lane when Karen comes to check out with a mountain of groceries. This woman already looks like a typical Karen, complete with the haircut and everything. However, I don't like to judge people based on their appearances, so I greet the Karen warmly and with a smile. Hello, how are you? I'd be better if this store wasn't so freaking confusing. I couldn't even find the gift cards. What kind of a store doesn't have gift cards? I noticed that there was a gift card stand right next to my checkouts. I've got a stand right over here if you'd like one. The Karen was looking at her phone. Good. Get me two Chick-fil-A $10 cards and hurry. I'm so tired of standing. Now I knew that although it wasn't ideal, I could walk that far. Of course, just a moment, I say. I walk over to the stand, grab the gift cards, and come back to Karen putting my stool off to the side and sitting on it. Good, you're back. Ring up my stuff and tell me when you're done. I need to call my mother. I was dying on the inside because it's a self-checkout, but I didn't want to be yelled at any further. Mom, I'd be happy to help you scan your items, but I need my stool in order for me to do that. <laughs> Excuse me? I'm a paying customer. I'm tired and I want to sit. Now do as I say or I'll get you fired. My legs are starting to shake at this point and the pain is beginning in my knees and ankles. Mom, I have a physical disability and I use that stool to avoid getting hurt. If I stand for too long, I get in a lot of pain. Well, I had to stand for hours to get all of this and you're probably faking your disability so you can sit. Just check me out. Now, my nice supervisor, who must have heard all of the commotion, comes over and sees that I'm standing and obviously in a lot of pain. Hey, OP, what's going on? Why aren't you sitting on your stool? Finally, a manager, your stupid employee won't ring up my stuff and she's wanting me to give her my stool so she can sit on her freaking lazy butt. It was at this point that my legs give out and I fall to the ground, crying in pain. OP, are you okay? My supervisor goes on his walkie-talkie and calls a code that means an employee is injured. Oh, don't be so dramatic. She's obviously faking it. Mom, she has a physical disability and needs that stool. Not to mention that you're at a self-checkout. If you want a cashier to check you out, you should head over to our staff registers. But I don't want to wait in that line. At this point, the manager of our store has come practically running from the back. 
what has happened here does she need an ambulance i shake my head no still crying meanwhile karen starts snapping at the manager hello i still need someone to ring me up my ice cream is going to melt mom we have an emergency with our employee we need to help her first once this has all been settled i'll gladly help you she's faking it and besides she's too fat for this stool anyways mom get out of the store or i will call security you do not get to talk about my employee like that you have to check me out it's the law leave now the karen then starts screaming at my manager that we clearly don't know who she is or what she can do to us if we don't check her out immediately during her rants my nice manager finally having heard enough turns to the supervisor supervisor call security he nods and calls for them on his walkie karen then shrieks even louder demanding the number for corporate so that she can report how horrible this store is at customer service security shows up quickly and they almost drag karen out of the store the manager and supervisor make sure i'm okay and tell me to take the rest of the day off fully paid they then call my mum, who comes to pick me up and take me to the urgent care just to be sure now i'm fine but they give me a note to take some time off to rest later i was told that the karen was banned from the store moral of the story don't mess with disabled people's accommodations i'm sorry but the fact that that moral even needs to be written down by op is actually shocking who would ever mess with a disabled person's stuff it's honestly unbelievable um i actually got quite into that story taking the role of karen i was getting pretty loud i had to calm myself down halfway through but honestly that story is just baffling incredible scenes again three very well ridiculous stories in this one to be honest i don't really know which one was worse they were all pretty terrible i mean actually guys comment down below who do you reckon was the worst karen out of the three we saw i have to go with the second one because that younger sister like her morals and her her viewpoints on life are just honestly shocking but the other two weren't that great either let's be honest let me know down below comment who was the worst one so there we go guys that is going to do it for three hours of the very best recent entitled parent stories really hope you enjoyed this one if you did and you haven't yet already subscribe follow drop a like on this video if you're on youtube and leave a comment as well let me know if you really enjoyed it because uh, i love reading the comments and seeing your comments and i love comments pretty crazy hey if you're new to the channel hit the subscribe button i've already said that this is the worst outro ever but i'm gonna leave it in because that is the way that i roll